Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for the 16th annual Kernikan Center Symposium. I am Pippa Lowengard, the director of the Kernikan Center, and I am so happy that you're joining us today. We have a record number of registrants, uh, and I welcome you all. It speaks to both the uh, interest in the topic and the wonderful speakers we have today, a truly all-star panel. Uh, the topic, as you know, is NFTs. We are certainly not the first, nor will be the, we will be the last to cover uh, this emerging technology and its impact on the law. Like many of you, this is not the first discussion uh, on a subject that I have attended this year. Um, but as the year progressed, I was struck uh, by the lack of discussion of the legal, specifically the copyright aspects uh, of these new and self-defined uh, unique uh, items. So as a copyright scholar, I kept wondering how sections such as 109 or 512 of the Copyright Act would apply to these strings of code. And so the idea for today was born. Uh, I will admit that I am a questioner. Uh, I am certainly not an expert. So I am the everyman in this, in this debate, this discussion as much as everyone in our audience is. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are even more well-versed than I. Um, today we'll start with an overview of NFTs from Stuart Levy, Levy who is at Skadden Arps. Um, I heard Stuart speak at a meeting I went to uh, and it cleared up so many of the questions I had about how NFTs were born and how they work that I knew that if I hosted an event on NFTs, he was the person to lead it off. And I'm thrilled that he agreed to join us. Mm -hmm. We'll then have a panel focusing on the copyright questions that arise in connection to music, video games, and basically anything other than the visual arts. We'll save that for the second half of the program when pioneering artist Kevin McCoy, widely credited with being the first visual artist to exploit this technology, will give a second keynote address. Following Kevin, our second panel will focus on the effects of NFTs on the visual arts, both on the creation process and the impact of NFTs on the marketplace, as well as the copyright issues facing creators. Since we all know people's Zoom tolerance is low, we have condensed the day into four hours, but this is clearly a topic that could be discussed for several days. I hope you understand that we might zip over some things of interest to you and we apologize for that. Maybe we'll do that on part two in the spring. Um, I want to thank two people who have been crucial in the planning of this conference. Megan No, a panelist on our second panel, who has been my sounding board in the planning process and who is an expert in this area. Uh, and the center's program coordinator, Samara White, who has taken care of literally all the logistics. Should you have any technical questions about the day, please reach out to her either directly in the chat or via email at SSW2125 at columbia.edu. Without their advice and assistance, today's symposium would be half as successful as I'm sure it will be. And of course, thank you to the Kernikan Center's June Bessick, Jane Ginsburg, and Sean Balganesh for their support in organizing today's event. And finally, a huge thanks to our West Coasters among you, panelists especially, uh, but attendees too, for being so kind to be up at the crack of dawn to be here with us. Um, a couple of logistics before we get started. Throughout the morning, you will be asked to answer a poll every 50 minutes or so. If you wish CLE credit, please respond so that your credit is duly processed by Columbia. Uh, question and answers, we ask that you put them in the Q&A rather than in the chat. The chat is really if you need to speak to Samara regarding technical questions um, or, or for the panelists uh, it, between themselves. Uh, but for questions for the panelists, please, again, put them in the Q&A, which I will be moderating. Uh, and uh, our bios of all of us uh, panelists are on our website, uh, as well as our CLE materials, the schedule of the day, and all of that. Uh, so I'm going to give very brief introductions uh, with just affiliations. Uh, please refer to the website for more detailed uh, backgrounds of all of our speakers. Uh, and so with that, uh, I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Stuart.
Okay, thanks, Pip. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, appreciate the introduction. Um, as Pippa mentioned, I'm uh, a partner at SCAD and ARPS uh, here in New York. Um, I mostly do technology transactions work. We have an IP and technology transactions department. Over the last six years, uh, a great deal of my work has been in the blockchain and digital asset space. And not surprisingly, over the last year, it has been NFTs nonstop all the time um, at a, from a variety of different perspectives. Um, as Pippa mentioned, um, we thought it'd be useful to start off with a presentation regarding exactly uh, what are um, NFTs. So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen um, and jump in. Put that one sec. Okay, so what exactly are NFTs? Uh, we often find that when we speak to um, clients or potential clients in this space or just um, are involved in discussions about this space, uh, after we talk about the legal issues for a few minutes, we often get a, actually could you explain to me what an NFT is? Um, and before you do that, you actually really need to understand what is even a blockchain. So let me start with that and then morph into what an NFT is. Uh, and try to set the stage for um, some of the discussions um, and the panelists that you're going to hear later this morning. So in order to understand a what a blockchain is, again, the building block to understanding what an NFT is, you have to keep in mind that for almost everything we do in the world today, we run things through a trusted third party. In other words, we run th things through a centralized system. That trusted third party could be a financial institution, could be a publisher, um, could be a clearinghouse. But what a trusted third party does is it vets uh, everybody on the network. Meaning um, in our diagram there, if Alice were wanted to transact with Tom, Tom needs to know whether Alice really has the money she claims to have in her account, whether Alice is a real person or, or something fictional. And we run things through a trusted third party and the trusted third party can verify that an account holder has the amount of money that they have in their account or has enough funds um, or has certain rights. There's a lot of um, activities that a trusted third party fulfills. The problem with a trusted third party is a couple of things. One is you're now from a security perspective running on a single entity to uh, run everything, which means if that trusted third party were to be compromised, it runs a risk for the entire network. Trusted third parties, of course, charge a fee as well they should because they're providing a service. It introduces some friction to the network. It can lead to delays. Um, but the most important thing is you have to trust a third party. And what if that third party were to disappear? Now, it's hard to think about that as, as a practical matter as we sit here in 2021. But to really understand the evolution and origin story of blockchain and then, of course, NFTs, you have to get your mind back into 2007 when uh, the financial services industry was being rocked. Lehman Brothers shut down, Bear Stearns shut down. Um, and the idea that a trusted third party could actually go out of business actually was a realistic conversation at that time. So at that time, someone, and no one knows to this day who it was, male, female group of people, I'll, I'll refer to it as a he just to make the conversation easier. easier. Um, but someone named Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a white paper, um, which was basically a computer science paper about, as you can see from the quote here, a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. In other words, what if you could have a, a network, uh, in this case, a financial services network, where you did not have that trusted third party and everything was run in a decentralized manner. And that is the origin of Bitcoin. The idea behind Bitcoin is what if we could have people in a distributed system where there is no trusted third party, but through a distributed computer network, you could verify transactions on the network, make sure they're legitimate, make sure people actually had funds in their account, could verify that someone is a legitimate account on the network, and you could do that all in a decentralized system. So what would you need to have a system like that and some basics behind like uh, blockchain technology? So if we're gonna replace a trusted centralized third party with a decentralized computer system that's doing all that, there are a few things that the community is gonna require. 
first of all, you'd want to be able to see the computer code that underlies that network that everyone's running on. If I'm going to Bank of America or Citibank or someone else, I, I trust them as an institution and the fact that the computer code that runs their network is proprietary doesn't really concern me because I trust them. If you're asking me to trust a decentralized computer system that is just running out in the world where the community, however you define that, is maintaining the system, I actually wanna see that computer code. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to be a computer scientist, but maybe my friend is and they look at it, but I, I have some assurance that there are computer scientists out there who are studying the code and will highlight the fact if there's a problem with the code, if the code's actually fraudulent and funnels all the money to one person, so one part is that the code is transparent, and that's true of blockchains. The code is open source, meaning you can actually see the source code. The second thing I would need and require is I actually want to see every transaction. So if you're asking me to trust a decentralized computer system, I would want every transaction to be transparent. Now, that does not mean that people's names and emails are necessarily, and in fact, most cases are not visible, but I'd want to have some sort of address system even if it's a pseudonymous string of letters and numbers, where I could verify on my own, if I wanted to, from the time that this network was first formed to today, to verify that someone actually has that money in their account. So transactions on a blockchain are also transparent, not just the code. Uh, another piece of blockchain technology, and one that is critically important for NFTs, is that through cryptography, and for purposes of this morning in the interest of time, we won't get into exactly how this works, but transactions are immutable. What that means is every block of transactions, that's why they're called blockchains, every block of transactions on a blockchain is built on top of, through crypt cryptography, the block before it. Meaning you, for all practical purposes, cannot go in and change a transaction that occurred three months ago. There are various things in, that would happen if you tried to do that, but transactions on a blockchain are cemented in place and therefore immutable. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a second, I don't you know, maybe understand this world too much, but I always have heard these stories about um, funds being misappropriated and fraud happening. And usually, in fact, almost inevitably, that happens on the on-ramps and off-ramps to get on or off of a blockchain, put your money into a blockchain, take your money out of a blockchain. The blockchains themselves are actually highly secure and for the most part with incredibly rare exceptions, immutable. Final point on blockchains and then we'll dive into NFTs. There's not one blockchain. This is a very common misconception in, in, for people first learning about NFTs. Um, a blockchain is a kind of technology or distributed ledgers kind of technology so the way we talk about the internet, you can't talk about the blockchain. Um, there's a Bitcoin blockchain that Bitcoin operates on. There's a blockchain called Ethereum, uh, which besides having its own currency known as ETH, also allows you to do a variety of different things. That's why NFTs are on uh, Ethereum for in great part, we'll get to that. Um, there's a Flow blockchain that's run by a company called Dapper Labs and is the blockchain on which NBA Top Shots, a very popular NFT, can be found. There's Solana blockchain, but the point is that they're different ones and they're not, for the most part, interoperable. So if you're on one chain, you cannot move it to another chain. It's almost like envisioning a time when uh, there were different text messaging services and unless you were on the same um, phone technology as someone else, you couldn't message someone else in the early days. Now they're all interoperable, but today blockchains are not, uh, for the most part, interoperable. Okay, so let's dive into non-fungible tokens and why they have this incredibly unusual name. So most blockchains are used for coins like Bitcoin or currencies, and all of those tokens or coins are fungible, meaning it's like a dollar bill. If I were to give Pippa $5 out of my wallet, she wouldn't care which $5 bills I pull out. They're all the same. They might have different serial numbers, but they're all the same. Same thing in the most part for tokens or coins that are on a blockchain. Every Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin. If I send someone five Bitcoin, they don't care which five Bitcoins I'm sending them. Those tokens are all fungible. 
But what if you could create a token on chain that was unique, hence non-fungible NFTs? So if you have unique tokens on a blockchain, you've now created the idea of having a, a transparent, immutable certificate that sits on a blockchain and has all the benefits of a blockchain. So what could you do with something like that, with that kind of technology? And to be sure, we're still at the nascent stages of how NFTs are being used. Um, but one thing it would allow you to do is you could tag a digital work as an original. And that, that certificate would say this version of this digital work is the original and all other copies of that work are just copies. We'll look at that in just a second. The other thing it would allow you to do is you could now start using blockchains to generate unique user IDs or unique passcodes, which would allow you to use that as a ticketing system, as a way to unlock tangible goods. There's a lot of different capabilities that would allow you to do. Uh, an early example of this was the group Kings of Leon, and they minted an NFT. Minting is the word used to describe creating an NFT, but they minted an NFT that not only provided you with access to certain of their music digitally, but also provided you with what was effect a golden ticket. And that ticket allowed you to access tangible real world experiences. It included tickets to their concerts um, for life. It included backstage pass rights and you know, a limousine. It included real tangible um, aspects. But for the most part, as we sit here right now, most NFTs are used to identify a digital work. And to highlight that, um, so this on your screen is a re reproduction of a digital art by an artist, digital artist named Beeple. Uh, it's every day is the first 5,000 days. It's a uh, collage or montage of uh, daily works that the digital artist Beeple did formed into one giant collage. It's relevant because it sold at Christie's at auction back in March for $69 million. Now, as you can see here on your screen, I was easily able, able to replicate that immediately and directly by uh, right -click, finding it online, right-clicking, cutting, pasting, inserting into my PowerPoint slide. And I have, you know, in five seconds, reproduced the exact image that someone paid $69 million for. Obviously, much easier than trying to replicate the physical work. But this, to be sure, is a copy of the work and not the original. Now, we can debate for hours uh, what the difference in value is, but I once heard a good analogy that I thought you know, drives the point home for people who think, well, I don't know, why would you spend so much money if you could just replicate it? And the idea is imagine that in the future, uh, technology evolves such that scientists could replicate the Mona Lisa in an identical way, meaning they could somehow reverse, you know, carbon date the, the, the pigments in the paint um, so that even if you did a chemical analysis, if you looked at two different Mona Lisas, they'd be identical in every way. They'd be absolutely impossible to distinguish. There's still a fair number of people, maybe even arguably a majority of people who would say, I don't know, I kind of want the one that da Vinci painted, not the one that someone created a copy of. So if you, you know, get your head around that sort of concept, that's the idea behind um, the idea of tagging something, even a digital work as an original, but it also allows you to, um, to release digital works in a way so that you can control them. You can control access to them. So I could have, I could be a garage band with an album and I only want to sell that to a thousand people. I could through an NFT tag them so that only people who have that NFT can unlock that work. So it provides a lot of power to the creator community. And we'll get to that um, in a moment because a lot of the focus of the discussion today will be on that community. So what exactly are NFTs? We have a little bit of an idea hopefully now of what they're, um, what they're meant to be. Um, so one of the most important things to know is that NFTs are really just pieces of computer code. We talk about them as non-fungible tokens because token is a word or coins are a word that are used a lot in the blockchain world, but really a, the, the T for token is not a token. 
um, but it's a piece of computer code that resides on a blockchain. Um, but that's a critically important point because what an NFT allows you to do because it is just a piece of computer code is it allows you to program it in ways that are incredibly complex um, and allows you to do a number of different functionalities. The one that is talked about the most and probably the most powerful use case for NFTs is that you could program an NFT such that every time that work attached to the NFT was sold, you can have value go to either the original artist, to rights holders, to agents. You could split it amongst a, a hundred different people. You can have a very complicated royalty scheme built in the NFT that works automatically. So again, every time the NFT changes hands, a portion of the purchase price would be sent to wallets of people who are designated to receive the benefit of the so-called secondary sales. If you think about it, that's a huge evolution because today if an artist sells a work for $10,000, they then become very famous. That work now sells for $3 million. They still just receive the benefit of that initial sale. They get nothing on the secondary sale as it increases in value. And NFT would allow them to take some percentage of those secondary sales or again, to have a few different people get those in an automated uh, fashion. One of the most important points though about NFTs and really ties into a lot of the legal issues that we see all the time is that um, the NFT is really the certificate of ownership. The digital work with which it is associated is typically not stored on a blockchain. So remember I said that blockchains are immutable, secure, have all these benefits. That's true of the NFT itself, this sort of certificate of ownership, but the work itself is usually stored on another type of media, another server on Amazon Web Services. There's a decentralized file system called the interplanetary file system where a lot of NFTs are stored. Um, discussion of that beyond the scope of this morning. Um, but the NFT itself, if you were to look at the computer code, tells you where that work can be found. So again, bringing it back to um, in the, sort of the, uh, the tangible world, imagine the difference between I've got art on my wall, and then in a locked file draw, I have certificates of ownership that say which work is mine, describes the work, says where you can find the work, um, but they're really two different things. Um, in conversation, people often talk about the digital work itself being the NFT. I just bought this NFT and I'll show you, you know, a picture. I might show you the Beeple work and say, you know, I bought this NFT. Um, so they're used interchangeably, but in reality, the NFT is, again, really just the certificate of ownership that ties to or is linked to an asset that is usually not stored on a blockchain. So we talk a lot about you know, NFTs. I mentioned at the beginning that you know, in our practice, it's been all NFTs all the time for about a year now, um, but NFTs are actually not a 2020 or 2021 creation. Um, they actually date back to the 2015 to 2017 time period. Um, CryptoPunks, which are back in the news a lot because they're amongst the original NFTs, um, are now being sold at auction at very high value because they're considered original art in this space. Um, but they go back all the way to June 2017. One of the big developments in this space was back then in uh, late 2017, um, NFT, NFT coding was standardized. Um, the name of the standard is there on the Ethereum blockchain. Remember I said every blockchain is different but a lot of NFTs are on the Ethereum blockchain. That's where the NFTs are stored for many, for many NFTs. Um, and there was a standard that was created and that was an important development in the history of NFTs because typically it is hard um, to have different um, buyers and sellers and users on a platform interact with each other if everyone has programmed their NFT in a different way. So by standardizing how the code should work, it allowed NFTs to flourish. That said, uh, as you know, it took about three years until NFTs um, became a mainstream development. So we get the question all the time, so what happened? You know, what was it about uh, Q3, Q4 of 2020 through 2021 
um, that added sort of the jet fuel to the NFT space. And there are a lot of different theories about that. Uh, one is that collectibles generally made a comeback, NFTs aside, baseball cards started getting uh, more popular. There's a theory that uh, the pandemic, there were a lot of people at home looking to do things. NFTs seemed interesting and fun and cute. Um, so people started getting involved with them. There's a theory that there's a lot of crypto wealth out there. People made a lot of money buying um, the ETH uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies early on looking to spend their money on things that were on a blockchain. Um, then, you know, once the wheel got going, then brands started focusing on this and didn't want to miss out on the opportunity. Um, so it's all probably coming together at once. And, you know, one of the themes that I know of today are, you know, fad or future. Um, and, and it's probably a little bit of both. I think that, and we'll talk a little bit more about some use cases. To be sure, part of it is a fad. Um, collectibles come and go, and this is probably no different. But NFTs have tremendous amounts of powers we'll talk about that really do make them in a very meaningful way the future, even if some of this um, collectibles market starts to fade over time. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about the NFT market today. And as I mentioned, some use cases, because I think it'll help bring to light what we mean about NFTs and why they're so powerful. So part of the NFT world, as I mentioned, to be sure, is the collectibles market. That is Marvel having an NFT of a Spider-Man where you can go to a website um, and buy a digital image of a Spider-Man that maybe is, you know, looks three-dimensional. You can spin it around. You can put it into a trophy case. It, you, can, you can light it up. Um, NBA Top Shots, as I mentioned, uh, is really what drew a lot of people to the space. Uh, NBA Top Shots is basically digital trading cards uh, with clips of video and done in a very artistic way. But these are really in the main collectibles, just like you might buy another collectible. Brands are experimenting with NFTs over the last number of months as a means of loyalty card. Remember I said it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, a digital identifier and brands are looking into whether there are ways that they can use these NFTs to mint what are effectively membership cards, loyalty cards, where they can easily add on additional benefits um, to the card they might allow you to sell the card to someone else. Imagine that I'm um, a customer of a certain retailer and I'm part of their loyalty program. Um, the card has become more and more valuable over time as the brand has added benefits to it. Um, but now I'm moving to a state, a country where that brand isn't available or I've gotten tired of that brand, but someone else is interested in getting that card from me. I could potentially sell that card to them, that NFT to them, and they can enjoy the benefits from the brand. Um, and maybe the brand gets a piece of every resale. So brands experimenting with that. The next area, probably the one that's the most interesting, and again, ties a lot into today's discussion, is a way for the creator class to disintermediate the central trusted authority in their vertical and connect directly with fans. That could be musicians who are using NFTs to distribute their content. So you buy an NFT, you're able to access my music. Digital artists doing that, getting around agents or galleries and being able to interact directly with a fan base. Video creators and animators, um, disintermediating studios. And again, doesn't mean like in a case like that, studios would go away, but studios in Hollywood hold a lot of sway. And whether they green light a project or not, is the whole game and the ability to be able to interact directly with a fan base by selling an NFT. The NFT unlocks your ability to access the content is something we're seeing a lot of. And same thing for authors. Imagine you're an author starting out and um, you, you can't get a publisher to publish your work, uh, but you feel that you can interact directly with a fan base who maybe buys your NFT. And maybe that NFT comes with um, some benefit. And that's a way that you can monetize your work. So in all of these cases, it's really not so much, and this is one thing, you know, way to look at it, not so much um, focusing on, say, the Beyonce's of the world, who, even if they're just getting pennies on every sale, are selling so many songs and albums that they can make an incredibly good living. But imagine anyone in the creator class who just has the 1,000 or 10,000 loyal, devoted fans 
um, who are willing to spend more than a few pennies to access that artist's creations. And the artists can make a very good livelihood by interacting with that core group, again, by selling NFTs and the NFT providing access to that work. Um, just to touch on two other um, aspects. So video games are also a really interesting potential use case for NFTs. Uh, if you think about it, uh, for anyone who's a video game player, video games depend often on in-game purchases of assets, um, buying a sword in a game, buying a skin that you can put your avatar in. But A, those are not transferable usually from game to game. And B, you can transfer that or sell that to someone else. NFTs, again, remember, it allows you to own a digital image, start to provide the capability for you to take ownership of something that is a digital work. And maybe you could transfer from game to game, sell it to someone else. Again, an area that we're at the early stages of. And then finally, I mentioned using NFTs as a ticket or some sort of pass into shows, to concerts, and to other um, experiences. One interesting thing I'll say this about NFTs generally and why it'd be an interesting inflection point. For a long time, ownership of a lot of works, a lot of creative works, was actually owning the work. We've moved over the last number of years into more of a licensing model. And what I mean by that isn't that when you owned it, you actually owned any intellectual property, but you actually owned an album, you owned a CD, you owned a DVD. Today, as you know, most of what we consume, we consume digitally on a, on a sort of rental basis. So you might go to a music platform and get access to music. You might go to a video streaming service and get access to videos. But we've moved away from the idea that you actually own uh, content or own copies of a content. And it'd be interesting to see if NFTs, because of what they allow you to do, bring back a little bit of the ownership concept uh, for the creator class. So uh, just to spend a couple of minutes on what the NFT market looks like so with different players in the NFT market. Um, so what are NFT marketplaces? These are places where you can go and buy and sell um, NFTs, no different from any other platform when you can buy and sell um, goods or services, but here's where you can buy and sell NFTs. Um, I actually kept in the OpenSea um, dollar number there just because it is only a couple of months old, but is already dramatically um, out, of, out of date. Uh, today, I think OpenSea recently announced that it has, oh, since its inception, has had 10 billion, 10 billion in NFT sales. Um, over time. And so huge um, business for marketplaces. Another uh, horizontal layer in the NFT space are right holders. Um, and those are brands, studios, labels, sports leagues, the people who have um, intellectual property that they're using and minting into NFTs, often in very creative ways. The art houses and the, the art auction houses are obviously into the space, Christie's and Sotheby's I mentioned. And then finally, there's a very interesting um, community of uh, what are known as PFPs for uh, play on profile pictures. Um, but these are NFTs that you can purchase and give you a digital image of um, a bored ape is one of them, Pudgy Penguin's another one. Um, but these are NFTs that you can buy and for now are collectibles. But the idea is that it would create some sort of, or be part of some sort of community um, that you can, you can join and take advantage of. So just a couple of more points and then turn it over uh, to our first panel. So one question we get a lot is, you start out by saying this is a whole decentralized system, eliminate the centralized third party, think back to 2007, think about um, wanting to get rid of that trusted third party, it sounds like when we talk about this space, we're talking about trusted third parties. We're talking about the open seas and the marketplaces and, and people controlling a lot. And that is a very fair point. Uh, a lot still to this day in the blockchain world generally, in the NFT world specifically, um, is still fairly centralized. We just sort of maybe move the points of centralization or change the points of centralization. So maybe a label might not have as much power as it once did or a studio or a publisher, that, that could evolve. Um, but if everyone's going through a marketplace, don't the marketplaces hold a lot of power? And the answer is that they do, at least as we sit here today. 
Um, one really good example of that is I mentioned that one of the powers behind NFTs is the ability to program the code so that you can have royalties automatically paid to the creator, to rights holders. Um, as we, it, it's evolving, but as we sit here right now, a lot of that is actually done through the platforms and not on an automated basis through the NFT you purchase. So you're dependent on the platform uh, to provide those resale amounts. You're also dependent on the platform in order to have an agreement to which you as the purchaser are agreeing to. So the terms that attach to your NFT are, again, as we sit here in November, 2021, still very much driven by what are the rights and obligations imposed by the platform on which you purchased your NFT. Um, I wanna to touch on one uh, final point and then uh, have a closing thought or two. Um, one thing you, you can't be in the NFT space today uh, without coming across something known as DAOs. Uh, it's spelled D-A-O, but pronounced DAO which stands for a decentralized autonomous organization. So just to spend a minute on that because they're very big in the NFT space and getting bigger. Basically the idea behind a DAO is to do for financial services or do for the creator community uh, for corporations. Meaning instead of having a corporate structure where you've got a board and an executive suite and everybody who might own an interest in that company or be a shareholder really doesn't have a meaningful say in what's happening to decentralize that and instead create a, a structure, um, let's call it a corporate structure, but a structure where <clears throat> the members of the organization are all the decision makers and can vote on things. What the DAO will do, what the DAO will purchase. We're still at, the, like with NFTs, DAOs have been around for a while, but have just gotten much, much more popular. Um, how they're characterized legally uh, is an interesting question that's evolving because of some new legislation that's out there. Um, but it's the idea of a decentralized group making decisions about um, different aspects without there being the traditional C-suite and board of directors DAOs are in, relevant to the NFT space because a lot of NFT projects rely on what the community feels, or you have a community buying NFTs and doing it through this decentralized autonomous organization. Again, what their legal status is varies widely depending on how the DAO is set up, but it's an important concept to know um, as, you, as you go out into the world of NFTs. Um, so finally, I just want to uh, close with this quote from Roy Amar at Stanford Research Institute, uh, which I think really, really captures uh, NFTs. I think that, and, and I often say this, people um, ask me all the time, uh, they, people like, I guess, the, the baseball analogy, and they'll ask, what inning are we in the evolution of NFTs? Uh, my own personal view is we're still in batting practice. Um, we're at the earliest stages of this technology but there's a tremendous amount of really innovative work doing in this space. I feel um, personally that a lot in the blockchain uh, world generally are sometimes people creating issues that really don't exist and then looking at blockchain as a way to try to solve the problem they created. And it's never a great fit. I really feel strongly that with NFTs, um, the idea of ownership of a digital work and um, how we handle um, digital rights was an issue that existed and, and relied a lot on solutions that maybe did not always benefit uh, the creators of those works. And NFTs really have the opportunity to revolutionize um, how we do that, how brands interact with people in a digital age um, and have, as I said a few minutes ago, I think much more, it's much more future than, than just being a fad. Uh, but the Roy Amaro quote, I think, is good. I think everybody feels, well, NFTs are going to change everything tomorrow. Um, and they're not. It, it's going to be a gradual process. But I think uh, you underestimate at your own risk um, the impact that NFTs will have in the long run. And I also believe that we'll get to a point where people won't even talk about NFTs. They'll just be in the background. And that will happen to be the technology as to how something works. But you're not even going to realize 
that when you got access to music or to tickets that there's an NFT behind it. You're not either, even maybe gonna hear that term, but I think that will be a way that a lot of um, uh, technology and a lot of um, digital rights are managed um, and sold in the future. And with that, uh, let me wrap up and turn it over, I think, to our first panel. Stuart, thank you so much. That was amazing, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, a CLE poll has just uh, come up for those of you interested in CLE. So if you do need uh, CLE in New York, uh, just click on that and uh, it will go through. So I do, uh, Stuart, again, thank you. Uh, amazing overview, just what we needed to kick off uh, an interesting discussion, uh, looking at some of these points a little more deeply and with an eye towards copyright. Um, but it, I think we're all now uh, on the same level in terms of understanding, which is great. Um, so our first panel feature, features uh, Adrian Perry, a partner at Covington and Berlin, Sean Sullivan uh, from Davis Wright Tremaine, uh, Andres Guadamuz uh, from the University of Sussex, uh, who is joining us from Paris today, uh, and Brian Fry from the uh, professor at the University of Kentucky. Um, and uh, we're going to be discussing really the nuts and bolts, as I said, of copyright. Uh, and, and how copyright fits in to this new regime. Certainly section, the, the, the 1976 act uh, has, has been a, a difficult, um, difficult, has had difficulty adapting to new technologies, um, whether it was the internet, uh, streaming, all of, uh, all of the technologies that have come down uh, the pike in the past 25 years. And uh, the Copyright Office and Congress have been sort of grappling with that. Certainly intellectual property professors around the country have been dealing uh, with these questions. Uh, and so we have four experts here, uh, two practitioners, two professors who are gonna talk to us a little bit about what uh, they see uh, as the potential conflicts with the act and how the act is able to support uh, uh, digital technologies. Um, so, uh, before we get started, um, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the onset of the program, uh, we're not going to focus on the arts on this panel. So if you have questions, we've got a very active and robust Q&A going, which is great. Um, but if you have questions about the visual arts and how they're affected, I'm going to ask you to hold those off until the second panel. Um, right now we're going to talk, uh, about video games, um, Sean Sullivan uh, represents a lot of content producers in that area. Adrian Perry works with a lot of musicians uh, and, and uh, uh, music groups, uh, and he's gonna talk about that. Um, and Brian Andres are gonna talk to us about uh, the, the intellectual property uh, end of it as well. Certainly Sean and Adrian are gonna address that too. Um, but uh, he, uh, I wanna kick off by saying, Brian, um, there is something going on in the metaverse right now as we speak here. Uh, and if you could just briefly describe it so that everyone in the room knows sort of uh, what's going on on the side. Cool, yeah, thanks. So uh, <clears throat> in honor of this panel, I, uh, I created a NFT collection called the Andy Warhol's Pantry tokens collection and it's it it's been priced and is up for sale right now so people are uh as they find it they're they're snapping them up um essentially the collection consists of uh, a series of 60 uh original artworks i created by uh removing limited edition warhol prints from the amy vanderbilt complete cookbook which amy uh which andy warhol illustrated in in 1951 and those uh, limited edition prints are stuck to cards which are then scanned and listed on the OpenSea site uh, for purchase for 0.1 ETH and uh, the NFT associated with each work is essentially a claim ticket for the original work of art itself, which will be stored in the uh, Brian L. Fry International Art Warehouse shoebox in an undisclosed 
location. Uh, and if uh, a purchaser of the NFT wants to exchange the NFT for the uh, original work of art in question, they can do so by burning the NFT, sending it to a burn address, and informing me of their, uh, of their mail address, in which case I will mail them the original artwork. I will remove it from the International Art Shoebox Freehold and uh, mail them the original work of art at any time that that they choose. Uh, so I constructed this particular work with the intention of posing a series of potential copyright related problems. Um, I, I believe it is non-infringing in any way, um, but I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts. And if you go check out the collection, which I can, I can, put, in the, I can put a link in the chat, um, it also includes a link to a short essay that I wrote describing the collection, how it was created, some of the problems or questions it, it proposes and suggestions about how that might inform the way we think about the relationship between the NFT market and what it's for and how we think about copyright protection in the digital space. Awesome. I think that the, the most burning question for the panelists is um, we all get a share, right? So whatever it goes for, we all contributed to the attraction and we all get a cut. So we'll, we'll discuss that later when you put the terms and conditions up. Um, okay, Brian, that's great. And I look forward to, at the end of the panel, you will tell us what it, if anyone went for it and how much or them. There's 60 of them. So we can all plan our retirements while we talk. Um, okay. Uh, and, and Brian, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic because I know that you have made quite a fortune uh, on NFT. So uh, I, I mean it. Um, okay, um, I guess I wanna start with Sean uh, and Adrian and ask, uh, building off what Stuart said, how are your clients using NFTs? And one thing that, that Stuart said that made got me thinking um, is why use an NFT? Like what's the advantage to, that your clients see? Uh, over just using a uh, regular uh, platform to, to attract new customers or to allow interaction with, with the musician or the gaming company? Um, I can go first. I, and trying to separate out my visual arts side from my gaming side a little bit, because um, I work with both. I think uh, I, I typically represent content owners, um, not, not exclusively, but um, for the most part, I represent content owners and large, con you know, content owners from a large scale perspective. They've got a portfolio of content. They're looking for ways to engage with their fans and engage with a community um, in the gaming industry in particular. Um, they're, they've got a very active and robust community that are very interested in new ways to interact with um, whatever it is, whether it be the property that they have a specific interest in, um, let's say they're, you know, there's very um, adamant fans of the varying games that are out there, things like Halo, things like um, Call of Duty, whatever it might be, they're, they're going to be actively engaged in that, in that game and want to find ways to interact with the game in a different way. NFTs for that industry have offered a way for them to further fan engagement, to further the ability to have fans interact with the game in a, in a way, the same way that I think when skins, um, the overlay for various skins and offerings for avatars offered an engagement for their fan community, NFTs are doing the same thing, but with an additional overlay that there's this concept of ownership. They're buying some sense of I get to be a part of this game and I get to own a piece of property that's related to the game. Um, so that's really from a content owner perspective, they're furthering their reach within the community that they already have and also uh, giving the ability to expand into the new audience, those that might not have otherwise engaged with the game because they've got this other concept of, look, I get to actually participate and own a piece of this game that I otherwise may not have had an interest in, but this is offering a new way for them to kind of engage and interact with the game. Yeah, and just picking up there, um, you know, I, I tend to represent uh, record companies and, and film studios and other content owners in, in that side of the world. Um, you know, uh, but like Sean, also, you know, also done work with 
with platforms and whatnot, but um, but generally focused on on content owners and sort of film and music and and uh, you know agree with a lot of what, what Sean said as far as you know why why are folks doing this? Um, you know, it's a way to you know have another avenue for for content exploitation. Um, you know, uh, a way to really engage with fans in a more direct way. Um, and um, and and have real you know exclusive content. I mean, it, Stuart, um, you know, sort of alluded to this. You know, sort of the all the possibilities with um, with NFTs and what they can what, what they can allow. I mean, there's a lot of utility, you know, in the ticketing space, for example, and you know the provenance of of you know where you're getting your tickets from, or um, you know that there, there are use cases where you know folks are looking into and already doing you know selling uh, NFTs tied to royalty streams, which setting aside all the regulatory issues and other problems that can come with that, that is something that people are, are, you know, looking at. And then of course there's, you know, the sort of, I don't know that there's anything that's traditional, but you know, the more common way is, oh yeah, I'm an NFT that gives you access to an exclusive video or a song or something like that. And, um, so, so that, I mean, so far, I mean, that, that's kind of been, Mostly, what what I've been seeing is is folks trying to find a new way to, you know, package up interesting content and uh, just generate that sort of engagement and, and excitement with with fans. So, so at a high level, I mean that that's what's been going on. So, um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so how, when, when you uh, advise your clients to, uh, that this, you know, your client comes to you and says, I think we want to use NFTs as a way to promote this song or, or to, to uh, offer new levels in a video game or whatever it might be. Um, what is your first advice to them? And what rights are, are you suggesting or do they want to attach to them? Um, yeah, I don't know. You, you go first start. on that one, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll start this time. Um, so uh, again, keeping in mind sort of I'm coming at it from sort of the, the music and, and whatever TV film world. So in that universe, there's a lot of stakeholders. Um, so the, you know, in the content, um, as opposed to like, if you represent maybe an independent musician that has all their rights, they haven't signed a record deal, they don't have a publisher, you know, if you are re representing, you know, a large, you know, content company, um, the first thing I ask is, you know, what, what rights do you have to grant and, and think about, you know, okay, you want to create uh, an NFT in this song with this video, um, you know, do you have the, do you have the rights to grant are there other third parties that have to grant rights? Okay, you have some rights. How long do you have the rights for? Are you the outright owner of this particular piece of content? Are you just a distributor with maybe a 20 year license to distribute? Um, these are the types of questions you, you sort through. Like that's the first thing I think about is sort of the rights issues. Um, you know, in an ideal world, um, you know, you wanna be able to use a piece of content that you have as much control over as possible, um, in part because you want to you want the end user ultimately to have uh, the ability to access that content for as long as possible. Because I think that's the expectation. Um, but that's just sort of the nature of sort of digital streaming um, is these these rights are not always often are not perpetual and, and can go away. So that's a thing we have to wrestle through as the first step is sort of who has, you know, what's the content? What rights do you have? What rights do you want to grant? What rights can you grant? And then you have to figure out your ability to sort of deal with problems that may come up down the line, right? Like if you have to pull content down. So, so I'll stop there. I'm Sean, feel free to, to pick it up. Probably some of the same, same issues on your end. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, and kind of, dancing between the different worlds, I think both Adrian and I live in um, from the, you know, the major content owners in the film and TV industry side of things. We have 
similar questions we have to ask. You know, you've got a property that you really, really, really like and want to promote and further. Well, okay, that's great, but you know, you're looking at bundles of rights that comprise the whole, and you have to figure out where all that goes. And I mean, I know we'll get into some of that, but the suit against Tarantino um, that just was recently filed by Miramax is, is a perfect example of that, where you've got certain reserved rights that were um, set forth in a separate agreement um, between Tarantino when he originally granted rights in um, Pulp Fiction over to the studio. But where those rights fall and how to dissect that, that, those are things that we have to kind of grapple with at inception point about, you know, what do you have? Certainly, if you're representing a major studio, you know they've got some rights. Um, and it's just more a matter of, okay, fine, we're going to work through those issues later. So what we typically do is we work through the, the concept of what do you want to do? What rights do you want to grant to ultimate purchasers? And how are you going to effectuate that through a platform that's going to allow you to both have the engagement with your, your community that you want, create a platform for you that is going to allow for that engagement in a, um, in a unique way that allows you to kind of um, accomplish the goal that you ultimately want. And like I said, a lot of what I hear from my clients is we want to have an engaging environment with our community that allows us to further kind of um, the, 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 the property the um, engagement with their community, the fan kind of relationship that they've already had. And these are kind of longstanding properties that they're looking to exploit in a way in which um, furthers engagement. So I think a lot of that is, uh, we, we deal with the same issues on inception point of uh, you know what rights you have, um, but a lot of that is also tied into, okay, what rights do you wanna grant and how are we going to you know, utilize that in a way those are the big content owners from smaller, you know, if you're looking for, you know, one-off sales or kind of other, other issues, we, we tend to look at the same issues, but we dissect it in a different way. Like what's the safest way we can accomplish an NFT sale, um, let's say for covers, magazine covers or other things like that. How do we do that in such a way that we don't have to clear as many rights um, at the inception point and you're using covers that are generally you retain all rights to so it's the same questions it's just done in a different way and a little bit simpler fashion if you're doing one-off sales or if you're doing things that are um uh you know that you can kind of compartmentalize and have a simple sale at first point and then work towards those other more complex issues later on so if you're auctioning a a, a magazine cover what exactly are you auctioning off there? Well, I think Stuart did a great job of breaking down what it is you're actually getting um, through an NFT sale and what you're auctioning off. You're getting the token that points you to the digital file, the, the copy, the digital copy of that magazine cover that shows the ownership. It's a unique digital file in some instances. Sometimes it'll be one of 50. Um, and it can depend on how you do it. It's a limited run, a limited series. But it's the same as if you were to create, in my mind at least, um, and this, I'm trying to dance between that visual arts thing and, and not getting into that, but prints. If you create a limited run of prints, it's the same concept. You're, you're creating 50 and they're numbered one through 50, right? Whatever they might be. I get number 25 when I buy my magazine cover, my NFT that points to the digital file that has uh, the magazine cover copy located in this file storage system, whether it be in Amazon Web Services, whether it be in the IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, wherever that digital file lives, I'm getting the token. Um, I'm acquiring the token that says that is mine. And that's, I think, you know, like I said, I think Stuart did a great job of highlighting that distinction because it is a distinction that we all have to kind of anyone who's working in the nft space we all deal with explaining this that what you acquire is a token um, in some cases you get the digital file but typically you do not you're getting the token and that token points you to the file and is your record of unique ownership of that file but what but I, but it's not an offline so when you're saying a magazine cover, I'm just trying to figure out, it's not like a, a hard copy of the magazine cover. 
Correct. It is, it, okay. Yeah. The um, hard copy of the magazine cover was already on the magazine. In this concept, what it is, is, is a digital recreation of that or copy of that magazine cover. And it can be, you know, done in different ways. I've seen them done in many different ways, whether it be, um, you, you know, contextualized with some other bells and whistles as creation point of an NFT, or it can be a simple, just digital file of that magazine cover, but they're very iconic magazine covers. They're the ones that you think of. Um, Time Magazine did some, um, New York Post has done some in terms of their covers, what they have and their moments in time. And you're purchasing basically an ownership right in that, in that moment in time that is like somewhat iconic. So if I, um, so, so you, you know, your client, say your client is the New York Post. Your client wants to, to sell off a, a copy, and I want to get to the word copy and, and bring in Andres when we're talking about what a copy is, but you're selling that. Uh, is a, assuming, okay, you're hoping it's a work for hire, that it's the picture on the cover is a work for hire, um, and you're hoping that everything was executed correctly. But say your client, the newspaper, didn't do a work for hire say it is a copyrighted image. What do you do in terms of, is it, and this comes to sort of to the Tarantino suit, is it assumed that that is all works ever now developed and known? Uh, or is it, uh, you know, are you renegotiating with these people? How does one do this if a work is not completely owned? That is a, a, a fantastic question and one we debate all the time because I, there isn't a clear answer in the NFT space yet um, with respect to one, I mean, you're getting beyond just the copyright concepts, you, you're getting into guild, um, guild issues also to a certain degree with some of the properties that you have, that, that we deal with um, specifically in the entertainment world. Um, and what their rights are going to be. But with respect to, you know, magazine covers or um, newspaper uh, front page of a newspaper, whatever it is, those are exactly the issues we deal with. You have to look at um, what images are being shown and do you own the rights to that? Adrian pointed that out in the very beginning. That's the first question. Do you have the rights in the photographs that exist in that image? Um, to the extent you're going to use any of those photographs. How about the uh, individuals that are shown in that photograph? Um, are you going to have to deal with any issues related to right of publicity or any other kind of concerns that you might have with the individuals that are shown in those images? Um, so I, I think the practical answer is we tend to advise on, you know, if you're going to do this, use the safe images first, um, use the ones that have less photographs in them that have, uh, that, that you can clearly state you own the rights to, um, and then work through the problems on the others afterward. And it, can, you, can you make a claim that you've got all rights in those works? Is there an argument that you've transformed it in some way, shape or form? Not if you're just doing a static image, but there are arguments, I mean, these are, in essence, to some degree, pieces of art. And if you can make that claim to it, can you can you make a claim that you've got the right to further exploit? Depends on the underlying license agreement that you got probably initially or the, the um, work for hire agreement that you had when individuals were contributing. Um, but I will turn it over to others to, to weigh in on that too, because I, I see heads, heads nodding, but I also see comments. Andres, uh, is, is that going to be, you know, uh, in, in some ways, you're our European and UK representative, but given that all of these transactions are international by nature, uh, what are the pitfalls that your, your clients, international clients, uh, or, or, or rather, what, when you're studying, you know, what are you seeing as the issues that internationally are coming up? Oof, uh, there are so many. <laughs> I could spend uh, uh, hours talking about this. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, I did want to start with a, a bit of a, a disclaimer. I've actually minted, bought, and sold a few NFTs, but I've managed only to lose money. 
So <laughs> I'm actually the absolute opposite of, 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 of Brian. Um, I think I'm not alone, by the way. Uh, there is a study in nature that 75% of all, it, it was published recently, 75% of all people or both sold, uh, sales have been under $15. So it's an interesting uh, uh, perspective. Now, um, I could do quite a lot of different aspects from an international perspective. I've selected just a few that I find may be different from an international perspective from uh, to, to what you may be experiencing in the US. Uh, and I'm going to give a, a UK and European perspective. And um, you may have noticed that I'm separating UK and European perspectives, uh, thank you, Brexit. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're no longer in Europe. Um, insert Brexit joke, I guess. Um, the first question I, uh, I've been looking at that I think it's, it's not um, explored quite a lot when we're talking about copyright, uh, is the substance of copyright in an NFT. Now, uh, there has already been quite a lot of talk that um, what you're getting with an NFT is, a met is the metadata, it's, it's a smart contract, it's code. In other words, the NFT is not the work, it's just a token that represents the work. Now, one of the interesting things that I've been looking at or, or thinking about as well is that um, this asset may or may not be protected by copyright. And I think that we are not really addressing this because a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, works, particularly collectible works, uh, are being procedurally generated. And this may not meet the originality standards in, in many countries, particularly in Europe, we have standard that a work has only copyright if it's an intellectual creation that reflects the personality of the author. Um, the wording in the law and the case law is along those lines. Now, what we mean here is that there has to be some form of, of choice of intellectual creation or intellectual activity. And I think that a lot of these procedurally generated works that I start life as a, um, as a stock character, they, they're then changed with different attributes. So they get glasses or cigarette or a hat or things like this. I don't think that uh, uh, all the time they meet uh, the requirements for copyright protection. So this is a question that we have to explore at some point. Uh, the second uh, point that I think may be uh, different from uh, one country to the other uh, is the question of transfer of rights. Uh, we've already heard quite a lot uh, that there, it's not very clear what you're getting when you're getting a, an NFT. Um, Assuming that the word has copyright, uh, does, can an NFT serve as a, a transfer of rights? Um, this is actually a little bit of a complica complicated question. And this is obviously jurisdiction specific. At least, for example, in the UK, we have a requirement of that work can only be assigned or, or transferred if uh, it's in written and uh, signed on behalf of, uh, of, of the seller. And there is growing recognition that there are going to be um, that cryptographic signatures can be used in order to uh, conduct a legal transaction. But I don't think that an NFT would meet the requirement of writing. So maybe the signature requirement, but not on writing. Um, then there are a few, uh, a few questions that may arise with copyright infringement that I, I also think that there may be a little bit different from one juris jurisdiction to the other. Um, I think that when someone generates an NFT uh, and they may not be using a work that they own or they're just taking a, an image from the internet or uh, something that doesn't belong, it, it belong to them. Uh, and this is not obviously idle speculation, Quentin Tarantino has just found out about it this week. So is that copyright infringement? I, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this and I think that, um, the minting on an, of an NFT is not copyright infringement, not necessarily copyright infringement, um, particularly in some jurisdictions. Um, generally speaking, at least in the UK, for there to be infringement, there has to be three requirements. Um, the infringer has to undertake one of the exclusive rights of the author with authorization. There has to be a causal connection between both works and the entirety of the work has to be copied. And I don't think that uh, maybe the first two are met, but I don't think that um, 
An NFT is a substantial copying of work. It's just code, it's metadata. And now, obviously there may be a link and it may be posted in, in a platform, but not necessarily. There are examples in which it may be linking uh, to a work. Um, uh, probably uh, um, there are many other areas. Uh, I think that uh, something that we can explore at some point is whether or not there are regulations that could apply and specifically for NFTs. There has been a little bit of talk on whether or not um, uh, NFTs uh, platforms could fall uh, foul of the very much maligned Digital Single Market Directive, um, which was passed in 2019. Uh, Article 17 of this directive um, introduces a new, new obligations for online content platform uh, platforms uh, that makes them directly liable for users that uh, post unauthorized uh, or infringing copyright materials. Um, there is, however, an exception for online marketplaces in this directive, which means that most platforms would not be covered by that. Uh, I could talk about all sorts of yeah. other things, uh, moral rights and authorship and all sorts of things, but I, I think I'll stop there. Well, I think that you brought up some things that I uh, really want to address, which are um, copies. What is a copy? Mm -hmm. um, have you made a copy? Uh, if, if you uh, make an NFT, uh, assuming that it's not, uh, well, I guess, have you made a copy if it's not an NFT? And Brian, have you made a copy if it's an NFT that's available in, in physical form? Um, and, and I know, I think I know what your answer will be, but I, I'm interested to, to hear it. Uh, and what is publication? Mm -hmm. And this comes to the Quentin Tarantino suit. This comes to the compendium definition of, of, of publication. Um, is, is an NFT solely for public display or performance? For those of you who aren't familiar with the compendium, um, I, I recommend it. It's a lovely casual read. But um, the compendium of the US Copyright Office states that if content is placed online solely, well, it doesn't say solely, but for the purpose of public display or performance, that work is deemed unpublished. Uh, so is an NFT unpublished? Uh, is it public display or performance? If you can print it out uh, or, or copy it in some way and distribute it, uh, does that void that? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. <clears throat> well, maybe I can speak a little bit more broadly. I mean, I guess in the you know, one of the law professors here after all. So my job is to speak in like lofty abstractions uh, rather than practical realities. Um, but uh, it, uh, looking at the NFT market more, more broadly and asking what people are, what people are buying, I'd like to kind of reframe that question because I, I think what the NFT market is, is a market for clout, right? When people buy an NFT, what they're buying is clout rather than control. And we have a habit of thinking about uh, production of works of authorship in terms of control, because we like to look at things through a copyright lens. Um, but from a kind of more abstract forward thinking perspective, I mean, I think it's important to remember that when it comes to digital works, copyright is pure transaction cost that exists only for the purpose of enabling monetization of works of authorship. So in an ideal world, we wouldn't bother with copyright at all because there's no cost associated with reproducing and distributing works. In theory, if we weren't worried about um, ensuring that people could monetize the works in question and claim as much of the positive externalities associated with them, we would just let everyone use digital works however they wanted to because they're, they're pure public goods. Right there, there's the you know consumption doesn't reduce supply at all. There's no reason to stop people from consuming them other than compensation. And the kind of primary justification for imposing copyright in the digital spheres is, sphere is a need to at this point compensate artists or authors for production of the works in the first place. Right? We recognize there are still pretty significant transactions costs on getting people to produce the works in the first instance, and solving that transaction cost is a problem. Copyright isn't necessarily all that good at it, 
right? We all know quite well that, you know, comp compensates some people a whole lot and compensates a lot of people nothing. Uh, and at the end of the day, the intermediaries end up claiming the lion's share of the revenue as well. What's really interesting to me about NFTs uh, and going back to some of what Stuart was saying and kind of maybe activating it a little bit is that it really refocuses the ability to claim a lot of that revenue on the person who's generating the works in the first instance. And so my hope is that the emergence of this new market and the indication that for a lot of consumers and potentially people investing in works of authorship, what they're really interested in is owning clout rather than control, right? They're interested in owning an association with a work of authorship that they can use for prestige oriented purposes, right? So that people know that, you know, I'm an important person or I'm an interesting person because I'm an owner, I'm recognized as a legitimate owner via this NFT of this work in question. And I don't need to control it. I want you to use it. The more you use it, the more important the work becomes and the more important the work becomes, the more value my, my, valuable my investment in the work becomes. And, and maybe, you know, if you want to think about it, uh, you know, kind of in a more abstract sense, what, what I'm really talking about is a securities market and celebrity, right? So essentially what you're saying is I'm investing in the idea that you're going to be an important famous person in the future. And buying NFTs of your work is kind of a proxy for saying, I'm investing in my belief that you're going to be important and people are going to think you're important and being associated with you is going to be desirable in the future. Um, I like to refer to this, I, I need to, so we, we tend to think of, in, of copyright in terms of ownership and ownership means control, right? When you own a copyright, it means you can control how other people are allowed to use something. So I'd like to propose like a new way of thinking, like ownership, right? So rather than having to be the person in control, you're the person who has the clout associated with the work in question. And if that's enough, maybe that's all we need in a lot of cases, right? Maybe a market in ownership can do all the uh, markets, market failure solving work that we need to see happening. And we can start thinking about maybe, you know, ramping down some of the, some of the transactions costs associated with the kind of pervasive copyright ownership in a digital sphere that, that, that really doesn't need or want that kind of control in the first place. Okay, okay. Um, but I, I, have to, I have to question that. Um, so in your Warhols, which are, first of all, co under copyright, um, second of all, uh, you've made them into physical items. Um, so as a law professor, I am thinking of the hypothetical that I could make up with your transaction. I've got copying, I've got distribution. Um, I think I have publication. Um, I have violated the display. I'm just going down one of one of uh, two of the copyright. I've got but, but literally everything you just said would apply to anything anyone sells on eBay or Amazon. So are you saying eBay is 100% copyright infringing? I mean, I'm just selling an object. Well, okay, so then we get into the first sale doctrine. Right. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I bought, um, I bought, I bought the limited edition prints that were printed in the cookbook, of which I purchased one edition. I cut them out of the cookbook and I stuck them on cards. I took pictures of the objects and I put them on open seats. No different than eBay. So, Sean, how do we get Redigi? I get around Redigi, Brian. How do we get around Redigi in this? There's, there's no Redigi problem because I'm not selling any digital files at all. I'm selling physical objects. The NFT is just a ticket for the physical object in this case. Yeah, I, uh, as long as, uh, to his point, if the digital file, if you created a digital file and that were the item that you're trying to resell by posting it online, then you get into the Redigi problem because the Redigi case um, and, and what, what it found is that you can't, the first sale doctrine doesn't apply to digital items because each time that a digital item is transferred, it's necessarily creating a copy of that digital item somewhere else. So it's violating the copyright, the copy um, exclusive right, rather than the distribution right, or rather than the, re, 
you know, any of the other rights that a copyright owner might have. So you can't but can go I, ahead, can, Ryan. Come on. I mean, come on. We all know why the court decided we did you. It had nothing to do with copyright doctrine. The court said, look, we did you, you saw a market where you could collect the profits and the record company couldn't. And that's not how that we want the market to work. We don't care what the doctrine, the doctrine was baloney in that, right? The, but the court said, it was the same situation with Aereo, where it said, look, you know, we know that you read the doctrine really carefully and you figured out a really clever way to avoid the law, but we don't like clever. We know what the market is and we want to make sure the person who is the copyright owner is in a position to collect the revenues from this kind of, of sale. And, that, and that, that, at the end of the day, that's what was happening. But if I go on OpenSea, I see the images that you're selling. So you've posted the images yeah, but when you go on eBay, you see you see images of the object that I'm selling. I mean, would it be any different if I sold these on eBay as opposed to on OpenSea? And, and there is case law out there that has held that you are allowed to exhibit images of a physical item that you're trying to sell. So to the extent that you're talking about taking a, a photograph of something that you want to sell online, um, there's a right to do that. Uh, you're allowed to do that in furtherance of your sale of that item. The exactly. downside, the, 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 the distinction that I think we get hung up on is NFTs don't necessarily need to be tied to a digital file. They don't. You can tie them to a physical item. So in his example, um, and, the, and the distinction here is if you're tying it to a, if he were selling the book in, in total, the entirety of the book without having cut out the images, just selling the book and he took a photo of the book and said, hey, I'm selling this. You can see it's in good quality. Everything's fine with it. Purchase this book for me. There's no problem with that um, because there are, you are allowed to do that in furtherance of that sale as long as you're not selling a digital copy of it as well. If he took photos of every single page of it, posted it online and said, hey, you're, you, you can purchase this. I'm distributing this. I think you might also run into some issues if you took photos of every single page and posted it online for everyone to look at without, without any um, uh, permission from the copyright owner. I think you would get in some trouble for that as well because you're effectively just creating digital images and posting them online, distributing them uh, broadly without getting those rights from the actual copyright owner. That would be a problem as well. But just posting an image of the book cover and saying, hey, I'm selling this, come and buy it from me, that doesn't run into your redigi problem. Even if, if I may intervene there, you may not even be linked to your own image. Uh, you can you can even be uh, using the person that uh, the image from the person that you're infringing. Um, yeah, and, and what you're showing is an embedded image um, that I guess would depend on whatever case law uh, applies to embedded images. And in, in Europe, it's actually quite permissive of allowing people to, per, uh, to, to show images. And, and I, I understand that US law is a little bit different, but uh, I actually have done this. I have an NFT of a uh, Nyan cat. I have created one, I'm, I'm, I'm selling it. I'm selling a, a copy and I, uh, it's not, the image that I'm selling is not even mine. I, I am just linking directly to the image of Nyan Cat that was sold for a million dollars. So I'm not even reproducing it myself. You're, I'm, ju I'm just uh, linking to something, to someone else's image. Yeah. So um, Brian, do you always sell the physical work so that you don't have to worry about no, yeah. no, just just for this just for this particular project because I wanted to pose a more interesting copyright related problem, yeah. which you did, which is awesome. Yes, um, <laughs> but how do you how do you justify if you're if you're not printing the physical copies? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, if you're selling links. I, I, I think I'm, I could be putting words in, in your mouth or actions in your, uh, in your, I don't know what one puts actions in, but uh, I have a feeling that, that you may have uh, in the past the offered for sale NFTs, which are linked to uh, works that you have copied, uh, whether from a digital or born digital work or a non-born digital work. 
uh, and, and, and offered for sale uh, in an online environment. And how do you justify that that's not infringement? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, you know, so I, I haven't really done that much of that just because it didn't seem that interesting to me. And I, I'm really more focused on creating and selling NFTs that I think are conceptually interesting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I did use like some random images to illustrate, like, for example, uh, I sold an NFT of the, of, the book, of the Brooklyn Bridge. So I used a stock photo of the Brooklyn Bridge just to remind people what it looks like. Um, or uh, the public domain. So I used a, you know, worm Ouroboros and sold a NFT of the concept of a non-rival NFT. Um, but, uh, but in general, I, I, I've actually been creating images because I needed something new in order to illustrate what it was that I was selling. So they've been primarily, I've been selling uh, NFTs that are uh, attempted to be securitized in some sense in order to talk about the relationship between the securities laws and ways of thinking about uh, digital assets. Uh, but as a general rule, I mean, again, like for me, the big picture point is, you know, how, you know, what role do we think in the long term copyright should play when it comes to digital assets where all it's doing is making them expensive, right, when they could be free. And so my question, the big picture question, I think the question that technologies like NFTs ask us to answer is, you know, copyright was a tool that we've used for a very long time in order to try to solve market failures in the production and distribution of works of authorship. And it was an okay tool for a long time, but it's not that great of a tool. And the digital world has really rubbed our nose in the extent to which it's a very poor tool in many respects for the kinds of things that we're doing in a digital universe, because a lot of the transactions cost, all the transactions costs really associated with reproduction and distribution are basically gone. Right. So that just makes copyright more and more of a transactions cost and more and more of something that causes market failures rather than solves them. And so my question is, you know, technology, social technology created copyright in the first place. And maybe technology has created a new tool or the potential for new tools that could work better to solve some of those problems without imposing the transactions cost, right? So maybe we can solve some of those market failures we're concerned about, like compensating authors for producing works of authorship in the first place without having to limit access to the goods. And that's why I like a market in clout, right? Because a market in clout is a market that says, I want everyone to be able to consume as much as possible without limiting their ability to consume. I wanna remove transactions costs rather than impose them because the more consumption that happens, the more valuable, socially valuable, potentially economically valuable, that clout associated with my form of ownership <laughs> becomes, right? And I think that that would be a really salutary uh, social development, right? In the sense, if we could eliminate a lot of these artificial restrictions that you know, are intended only to try to solve certain kind of problems, but don't solve them very well, I think that would be a really a great thing. So we're getting tons of audience questions and I want to try to address them as they seem relevant. Someone asks, are you really trying to avoid copyright in order to support patent law in this area? Uh, I guess with the creation of an NFT, I'm not quite sure. I have no, uh, idea. I have no idea what they're talking about. Okay. Um, if Twitter shows a CryptoPunks NFT containing the link to the underlying asset owned by Larva Lab, is that copyright infringement? What it's showing is not the punk itself, but the NFT pointing to it. I'm not sure. I, I'm, just, I'm not even sure. I don't, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think it is. Um, and I, uh, as I mentioned, I don't think it, it, CryptoPunks would have copyright in most places. Uh, if they're procedurally generated, there is no originality. I mean, more, more, to the, more to the point, right? The interesting thing that I think you see in this context is the people who own, own those NFTs are not upset by people. They want people to copy them. That's great. 
right? The more people who copy it, the more people distribute it, the more people talk about it, the more people look at it, the more people think it's cool or sucks or whatever, right? The more socially salient it is, the more valuable their relationship to it becomes, right? So it's not anti-copying, it's, it's pro-copying, right? When you, when you right-click save somebody's NFT, you're doing them a favor. You're not hurting them. They don't care if you copy it. That's fine. That's, they want you to copy it. That's great. Do more. Yeah, I agree. No, oh, that's true in every case. I mean, if I have an NFT in a, you know, exclusive, you know, there's 500 people have rights to listen to this secret track from, you know, artist X. I don't want other people getting access to that song when I paid X amount of dollars to get it. So, I mean, I think there's, you've made a lot of good points. Uh, just NFTs, it's such a wide range Mm. of you're going to associate an NFT with anything. Mm. Um, you know, there are definitely instances where promoting it and getting it out there, whatever the thing that's associated with the NFT is helpful. But then there's other instances where maybe you're relying on the exclusivity and, uh, you know, exclusivity of access where the copying is, is not so great. And it just, it's, you know, completely fact dependent, but just want to throw that mm. out there. Mm. Yeah, like everything else, I think some people are, are happy just to get the distribution and some people are more concerned. Um, uh, Jane Ginsburg asked, what's the difference between the clout enjoyed by an NFT owner and that enjoyed by the owner of the physical original, where there is a physical original? Um, I don't think there really is one, right? And that's one of the things that I think is interesting about the NFT market. And I, I like to characterize it well, look, there are two different points I really think are important to recognize, right? Many markets have always been a market for clout, right? So for example, when you buy an expensive painting like a Warhol or a Pollock or the Mona Lisa, you're not really buying a painting in the meaningful sense, right? What you're buying is a spot on a catalog raisonne that comes along with a dirty canvas or a lumpy rock, right? And the dirty canvas or the lumpy rock is, kind of stands in for what you're what the value of what you're buying really is inherent in which is that spot on the catalog resume right it's basically just a token that people value a lot because it happens to be associated with the career of of a very famous artist right so i don't really think you know it'll, it at least one segment i think adrian's right that like there's a lot nfts can, it's not one market and i it's, i think it's already not one market it's going to be a whole bunch of different markets and a whole bunch of different things potentially used for a whole bunch of very different maybe totally unrelated purposes but at least in one market for nfts what people are buying is uh, ex an exclusive association with a particular kind of fame and I don't think that's really any different from what they're buying in a conventional art market. The big difference is that people live online, right? And they want that kind of clout online. They don't want it in their house anymore, right? If I hang a painting on the wall in my house, nobody really sees it except for me. Whereas if I have an exclusive association with the digital asset, right? That's the kind of thing that I can like play up like on the internet where all the people I actually care about and all the people who actually know who I am and who know what I'm doing and are like following me and talking about me, et cetera, et cetera. That's where they are. And, you know, that's just a, that's just a change in where people live, how they live and what's salient to them. And I think that it affects the way that they value certain kinds of, you know, it's just the new clout as it were. I think, yeah, that might, um, yeah, I think that, that that brings up many questions that have gone on for all of time as to what is the value of a, of a painting and where does that lie or what is the value of anything that we purchase and, and where where do we, we like it? It's the same as wh why we want copyright and do some people think of other things as more... Um, I'll make, I mean, I'll make whether one of the point, right? When you, when you go to an art gallery and you buy a painting, and you walk out of the gallery, the painting is worth nothing because there's no secondary market in paintings beyond a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction for which you can actually resell on the secondary market, right? So, I mean, like the value is, is very clearly the association with an artist whose career is seen broadly as being one that's gonna be valuable. I know I'm kind of 
leaning into the art conversation, but bear with me, right? Uh, that one of the interesting things about the NFT market is that, you know, people talk about, oh, well, a lot of people didn't make money or, you know, oh, it's hard to resell things. Well, you know, I mean, that, that's true. And I totally buy it. And it's not as a liquid as a lot of markets could be. But one thing it's way more a liquid in is than is more liquid than is the secondary market and art sales, right? I mean, I'm a nobody, but people are already <laughs> reselling the art that I've sold as NFTs for more than they paid for it which is for me, it was a very eye-opening and interesting development, right? Because I'm like, how is this even happening? They're, they're, you know, they're turning a profit, reselling stuff that, that I created, sometimes already selling it for three times more, even though my, my NFT conceptual art career is all of three months old now. Which is, which is interesting. It creates a problem if the situation is that the original was infringing and then it's being disseminated. Um, I, I want to go back to the, the woman uh, or a gentleman, I'm not sure, who posted the question about uh, the, tweet, the tweet. I think what they were saying is that they posted a tweet of the link to the uh, NFT, not to the item um, or to the auction of the NFT where a picture of the item is. Lit. And I want to talk a little bit about copying and dissemination. Um, so definitely there are uh, many, many things online that are being auctioned that are not infringing, and I'm not suggesting that. But we get into some issues because there definitely are things online that are infringing, okay? Um, and even if you post, um, you're auctioning your own work. Uh, if someone then right clicks that and disseminates it or tweets a link to the auction, what, what remedies do we have and what do we do in these situations? I'll, have one else go first. I'll, I'll give it a go. What's happening so far, the, uh, the, big, the best practice right now is to go to the platform and try to get the work removed from the platform is being very efficient. Uh, so far, I've seen lots of works that have been removed. You just go to the form. They, most of these platforms have a DMCA takedown, notice and takedown procedure, and they will uh, platforms will remove it. Um, it's, it's the same as, may, as any other platform. Um, they remove and, uh, and ask questions later. Uh, so generally, um, the platforms are actually emerging as, as, as very powerful right now, particularly OpenSea. If OpenSea removes something, it's almost like it's, it doesn't exist. Now, of course, it can be resolved privately, et cetera, et cetera. But the platforms um, are efficient um, enforcement mechanisms. Sean or Adrian, could you address um, the liability of the platforms if there is any? Well, I mean, what I can say is, you know, when we're working on these agreements for our clients on the content owner side, it's, you know, it's important that we have the ability to, you know, compel removal of, of content if there are rights issues that come up. And this, this creates, you know, an inherent tension with the idea of like, well, I'm buying an NFT, which is going to give me access to, you know, let's stick in the digital content, you know sphere for now uh you're buying an nft that gives you access to a video or a song or something um you know the, the if you're spending money on an nft you, you know generally the expectation is you're going to have access to it but you know you have to read the terms of service um because generally the terms of service make clear just like in any digital rights context that you know content can can go away um so that's the type of thing that, you know, as the content owner providing a license, you know, we have to have that flexibility because, you know, for the reasons we kind of talked about towards the beginning of the panel, um, because you just never know what rights issues could come up. Even if you were pretty confident in the rights you were granting, you know, there could be reasons why you need to pull content down. So that's definitely something that, you know, when we're dealing with platforms, we're, we're focused on that, not only from a legal perspective, like putting contractual mechanisms in place to say like, look, you got to do this if we ask, but also making sure there's actually the technical capability to do that. Because like with IPFS, 
that content just lives there. It, you can't pull it down. But what you can do is you can remove the pointer so that the person can't access it anymore, which is better than nothing. But that's something you know, we have to talk our clients through that you know, so they understand just the parameters of both the technological limitations and how that works. And also, of course, sort of addressing the legal. So uh, there's also, yeah, just to kind of build off of Adrian's point, there's two, two things I just wanted to mention. One with respect to making sure you have the technical, you know, capability to pull something down. Um, there, there are our concerns, or at least hey, this is something from a content owner perspective, we advise on because so many of the platforms, the, those entities that are offering the ability to create NFTs are, are new. They're, they're new companies. Um, there is the fear, what happens if the platform goes down? And what do you do to ensure, um, at least from a content owner perspective, that those who purchased the NFTs will still have the ability to view the content, will still have an, the ability to access the content they paid, they paid for. And from a content owner perspective, that's really important because you don't want to lose the trust of those that you've you know, reached out to, your community that you're engaging with. And that's from both uh, uh, Omnibus, whether it be studio uh, clients or whether it be gaming clients, they, they really, they have that interest. And they don't want to lose that, that trust. So there, there's a lot of that that goes into the back end of, Okay, what happens? What's going to happen to the portfolio of digital assets if this company, you know, doesn't make it, for example? Um, and they have to be able to be ported over to a different cloud-based system if it's not IPFS. If they're storing on some other. Then we need to be able to port over those links in in a you know manageable way so that there's protection there. Um, but stepping back to the other question you raised in terms of you know, looking at it from a platform perspective, what protections they, they can avail themselves of and are they going to be able to avail themselves of the DMCA protections? I, I think it's also important to note that, you know, we've been talking about this from the OpenSea perspective and, and people just creating NFTs and posting them there. But a lot of these platforms are involved in the curation of these NFTs and creation of them. So to the extent that they're involved in it, um, and they're working with the content owners to create NFTs, that's going to be a problem, you know, from their perspective in terms of availing themselves of DMCA protection. So they're, they're uh, you know, putting aside whether or not they're actually complying with all the other requirements. They have a robust notice and takedown procedure. They've got red flag warning systems in place, all those kind of things that you typically look at from a platform perspective. There's also this concept in the NFT world that they're, they're adding elements in, in many cases, not in an open, not necessarily in an open sea context, but if you're looking at it from the perspective of um, these stores that are cre created and curated for, you know, manufacturing and sale of these NFTs, they, it really is, they're manufacturing them, creating elements that go on top of them. And to the extent they're doing that, that's going to be a really hard argument to say that they're not involved, that it's at the direction of the user that they're posting this material because they're obviously involved in the creation of it. So um, th that, you know, with, with all the discussion in Congress about revamping um, 512 and 1201, this is definitely going to be an interesting discussion uh, that has not, from what I know, been addressed in, in those, uh, in the drafts of bills and things like that. Um, I, Someone asks, does OpenSea or any other platform have the ability to remove an allegedly infringing NFT via a DMC takedown violate the decentralized principle underlying NFTs? Fascinating question. Yes. Uh, I call it platform is law. Instead of code is law, platform, platform is, is law. law. Yeah. Um, in principle, yes. Uh, now, interestingly, the, the opposite is that um, some of the platforms are, or, or the infrastructure is showing a lot of resilience. Uh, just recently, uh, one of the Tezos uh, marketplaces um, um, collapsed pretty much. Uh, Ik et nunc, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. And it was immediately replaced. I had several NFTs in that platform and um, I just 
was able to connect my wallet to some something else and I was able to recover all of the NFT. So it's interesting. There is a lot of resilience built into the system, but also a lot of centrality that is emerging in particularly in the Ethereum marketplace because of the dominance of OpenSea. So I think it's a, it's an interesting question. Uh What, um, Brian, did you have something to say? I'm sorry, did I? No, okay. What, um, then what about, uh, Quentin, I wanna go back to remedies. I feel like we're sort of jumping around and I apologize for that, but I wanna go back to remedies for a minute. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Miramax Films sued Quentin Tarantino this week. Uh, Quentin Tarantino had made uh, uh, works of his, uh, the screenplay that he wrote for Pulp Fiction um, with some pictures added that he had, he had drawn um, available for, for sale uh, as NFTs uh, and Miramax sued. Uh, and they didn't just go with copyright infringement. They had different remedies. Are there remedies outside of the realm of copyright that we can use uh, to, to uh, try to target infringing NFTs? I mean, if it's the New York, if it was it was a New York Post, go back to that one, a trademark suit, yeah, um, right. right of publicity, things yeah. like that. Well, we, uh, I, I, I mean, I remember, it feels like ages ago, but um, I mean, we, we've been involved in NFTs for some time, but when the, the big push came um, in February, March, really March of this year, um, we were doing 25 page checklists uh, for, for companies that were entering into the space, looking out for these issues. Uh, like, what do you have to be concerned with? What do you need to look into? I think we've touched on a lot of them today. There are right of publicity. There are trademark issues um, to the extent that you're going to feature um, someone else's mark in, in a way that creates the impression that it's associated with that entity. I mean, those are, those are obviously issues that you're diving into. Um, there's securities laws, to overlays to some of this, especially in the gaming world, to the extent that you're creating. I think there was a question in the chat I, in the q and I didn't uh, focus on the details of it, but the concept of fractionalizing NFTs is a big touch point in the securities world. Um, I try to keep kind of the conversation of copyright, but I, you know, I'm an IP lawyer by trade, but I've had to learn a lot <laughs> in this space. You, you have to learn a lot of other fields, at least enough to talk with some knowledge about them. So to your question, are there other potential claims out there from Miramax, um, you know, certainly there's the breach of contract concept that they have because ultimately it's a license agreement. And so you're gonna get into some of the back and forth on license agreements. And I think that's something we've touched on today, but certainly from the large scale content owner perspective, um, they're granting only limited licenses in the digital, you know, the work of authorship, the, the work of authorship that's being associated with the NFT, they're granting only limited licenses to that. And it's a limited license to display it, to copy it for certain purposes, right? So the major claim that's going to come if someone violates that limited license is a breach of contract, breach of license agreement claim. Um, now, inherent in that is the problem. I think that, again, we kind of danced around a little bit and talked about how is that limited license being communicated to the purchaser? Because you do have, and Andres talked about this from a UK um, EU perspective, but you do have to have some sort of presentation of the terms in order for someone to accept it, right? And so we get into a lot of those discussions with platform owners with respect to, you need to present the terms in an open and obvious way so that a purchaser is who's acquiring it you know, is able to view them do that. I think the Miramax Tarantino example is an easy one because you've got contracts, you know, and so that's an easy one, but it's a little bit harder when you're talking about selling NFTs to a purchaser um, ultimately and what your claim is going to be against them and how do you show that the terms were presented to them in an open and obvious way so that they could have accepted them. Yeah, I mean, briefly on the Miramax Tarantino one, I mean, I'm not... Uh, you know, I haven't looked into all that deeply, but I read through the complaint and what they attached to it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not actually sure I fully understand what Miramax thinks its claim is. 
because there's a pretty broad exception for Tarantino to sell the screenplay. And as far as I can tell, that's literally all he's doing. Um, and my immediate takeaway from their complaint was Miramax sees a big pile of money in NFTs and it thinks if there's money, it should belong to Miramax. Uh, and it also realizes that people like Quentin Tarantino a lot more than they like Miramax and that they're not interested in buying an NFT from Miramax. They're interested in buying an NFT from Quentin Tarantino. And if they don't bring this lawsuit now, they're not going to be able to get any of that big pile of money. Maybe that's a excessively cynical, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that's right. One thing to, to just reinforce is how much contract matters in this space generally, right? So much of it is, you know, the contract between the ultimate NFT purchaser and the platform and what rights are flowing through from the licensors to the, to the platform. What does that contract look like? And now, you know, and then when you go back to the licensors, what, well, their rights may emanate from, from contracts or, you know, consulting or work for hire agreements, whatever. Um, you know, folk, I've seen some questions in the chat asking like, well, when you, when you buy an NFT, what do you get? I mean, I don't know. What does the contract say? I mean, it's the end. You what does the end user agreement say? Uh, because you can define whatever rights you want. You know, if you want, you want to hand over the the actual IP rights. I mean, you could do that. It's not really what's happening, but it's possible. You know, it's all based on co whatever contracts are being put in put in place. That's why that this issue that that Sean alluded to about subsequent purchasers, particularly when, when you have an NFT that goes off of like a walled garden platform. Because if you're buying NFTs in sort of one platform and reselling them on the same platform, you know, the same terms of use will pop up and, you know, you'll be able to theoretically click through like when a new user comes on and buys it from another user on that platform. What happens when the NFT though gets sold off that platform and goes on to like an open C or another third party uh, site? Um, how does the user terms from the prior site show up to that subsequent user? And that, I mean, that's something that we're all, you know, trying to grapple with and how to make that happen because you want that end user ultimately to, you know, the, the ultimate secondary sale purchaser to get presented with those terms, right? So they're enforceable. Um, and, and that's something you really have to, to figure out, right? Because how does that, you know, third or fourth person down the line know what their license rights are if the terms of service that ultimately granted those rights are like from another platform four steps before. So that's just something to, another thing to just keep in mind that, um, you know, the contractual element is very important here. And then there's this practical technical aspect of how do you make sure that those terms carry through and are actually presented uh, to, you know, users 10, you know, 10 blocks down the chain, so to speak. What, um, does fair use have a role in all of this? Is there fair use in, as a defense ever? How would sure. That work? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think there can be. It's very, like anything in the fair use world, it's incredibly fact specific. Um, and it, it comes down to ultimately what, what the use, you know, purpose and character of the use, I think, is going to be the primary consideration when you look at, you know, this. I, in the early days, again, of the this wave of NFTs, um, there were NFTs that were being offered by creators that were building off of, um, you know, I, I, won't, I can't get into necessarily details on it, but we're building off of social media posts. Um, or other directives or statements made by um, others about them. And people were creating NFTs to create commentary off of some of those um, statements that have been made about them. And, you know, to the extent that you're commenting on it, you know, creating an NFT for commentary purpose, even though there's a commercial aspect to it, you're selling it, that doesn't render it um, moot in terms of a fair use defense. There, it's a consideration. If you're if you're creating, you know, millions of NFTs and just selling them uh, of the same one, the same exact, uh, you know, image, uh, same kind of whatever it might be, little clip where you're creating a commentary, does that undercut the argument? Perhaps. Um, but if you're creating a, you know, a 
a limited run of NFTs that are, you know, a digital clip of you creating a commentary based on someone's statement, let's say about, you know, your, whether it be your um, race, your um, sexual identity, whatever it might be. Um, those are pieces that I think, you know, can clearly qualify. Um, so it really comes down to an analysis of that. And, and I, you know, somewhat stepping into the second panel, uh, NFTs, many of them are, you know, you can look at them as, you know, a, an artwork, a piece of art. And so if you can do that and you can claim fair use in the art world, you can do so with an NFT as well. Um, it really, I think, is factually dependent. It'll be interesting to see because with the Second Circuit's increased focus on market harm, um, especially in the art world, what what that means. But um, we have so many questions we haven't gotten to. Latin American uh, copyright and what it does mean, what it means for the gaming industry, the environmental impact, which is a little outside our scope, but obviously very important. Um, and uh, and the the copyright in the the data, the metadata, the program language, everything like that. Uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, we really need to have another symposium just about those things. Um, I want to thank you all for an incredibly dynamic panel. Uh, very interesting. I do want to know, Brian, where we stand monetarily. So, so far I've sold uh, 10 or 11 of the NFTs. So that's only about $4,500 during the course of the, uh, during the course of the panel. Well, Columbia says we can't pay speakers. Uh, so uh, we'll just take our money from Brian. Um, I want to really thank you. Uh, this has been absolutely a fascinating uh, hour and 15 minutes that, that should have been two hours, but thank you so much. Um, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes uh, and then come back with Kevin McCoy, uh, an artist who uh, created one of the first NFTs related to art and our and then followed by our panel of art lawyers talking about uh, NFTs in the visual arts space. So thank you very much, everyone. All right, take care.
Hi, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're on break uh, until you start at 11.15. Um, you're muted. I don't know if you know that, but uh, if you actually want to stay muted and turn off your video until we're ready to start again, it'll be 11.15. Okay, yeah, great. And then, um, and then, because um, I'm going to share screen, right? Is there, um, do you, do you, do you control that or I, oh, I say I control you that control in the normal that. way? Yeah. In normal way. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. Hey, Brian. Thanks so much. Okay.
Okay. I think we're going to start back. Uh, I am beyond thrilled to welcome our next keynote speaker, uh, artist Kevin McCoy. As I mentioned, uh, his bio, along with the rest of the panelists, uh, are in the uh, in, in the materials online. But uh, Kevin is an accomplished artist, uh, a technical whiz, a computer. Uh, um, genius in my book, a marketing expert, uh, and an all around uh, fascinating person who is going to share with us uh, the artist perspective uh, on NFTs. And there's no one better to do it because he's been in the market longer than any other artist out there. So thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks for that nice introduction. And I, I, I'll probably, maybe I'll try to fix your roof too. I'll throw that in there, plumbing, ditch digging, you know, I got, I got it all. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, today with, with all of you. Uh, I'm Kevin McCoy. Uh, I'm an artist here in, in New York. Um, I'm in my studio in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm also a prof uh, professor in the art department um, at NYU. Um, and uh, so hang on, let me do that. Okay. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to talk to you about uh, here. In fact, let me just start, let me share my screen and I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to get that out of the way. And then um, this is what we're talking about. Here's me. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about, yeah, from the artist's perspective is um, art and NFTs, art and the NFTs, I guess that should be an S there, we do that, art and NFTs, past and future. Um, and I think that it, there's a lot of kind of surprising um, details um, in the past part. Um, and I think that there's some pretty interesting stuff going on um, in the future part. So, um, and I'm going to center this, you know, because it is the artist's perspective. So I'm going to talk kind of about myself to start off with first. So, you know, I'm an artist um, and, and the work that I've done traditionally has always been um, media-based video, um, software, um, things like that. And so long ago, I was making videotapes, you know, that were um, kind of like, in, you know, independent films, little experimental films, things like that. Um, or I would be making um, internet based art in the 90s when art, you know, um, oh, this, you'll, like, you'll like this one here, watch this. Uh, this is a, a net artwork um, from uh, uh, 1999 that was just recently restored by the new museum. So you get to run it in emulator mode, you get to watch this cool Mac OS 9. Um, boot screen happen. Um, so this is a, you know, an internet based project uh, kind of from way back um, in the 90s. Um, and as we watch this uh, kind of start, um, this is actually beautiful technology, this emulation is really amazing. Um, but but all of the work that myself, you know, my friends, people that in our whole community at the time is all digital, all intangible. Um, and so at that time, there was very little way to um, participate um, in the art market, you know, there was no kind of kind of tangible works that could be made and could be sold. So you might show stuff in festivals, um, things like that, um, but you didn't really um, kind of participate, you know. And so the best you could do um, at that time, and so there's a, a piece of ours that um, that, that the Whitney acquired um, way back in the day, um, in, in in 2001. This kind of JavaScript based piece, basically it's a donation. You just kind of give it to them, and and you know, and, and it kind of gets its way into the into the collection, um, kind of you know, kind of, you know, kind of that way. Um, but there's really no sort of market mechanism, um, you know, going on for that. Um, and so um, that was my, my experience for a long time. That was uh, my friend's experience for a long time. Everybody kind of just, you know, really excited about these new technologies, but um, in this kind of intangible form, um, it was, uh, you know, you always were kind of on the sidelines. So myself, many artists that we know, um, adopted a kind of strategy of physicalization, you make your work sculptural. Um, and you turn your media ideas into, into objects. Um, and then that kind of worked, that worked well. You know? So we made, um, um, I say we, cause I, I make my art collaboratively with my wife, Jennifer. Um, you know, we, made, we made physical media sculptures and that um, met, with, met, you know, met, with, met with success. This is a piece that's in the Met um, that was just shown recently this past summer called Every Shot, Every Episode, um, making sculptures that included video and, and maybe kind of kinetics. This is a miniature film set. Uh, that we made with little model cameras um, in the MoMA collection um, that, you know, that, that worked really well um, and, 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 you know, was enjoyable. And um, another work and, um, and uh, Mudam in, in, in Luxembourg with this whole kind of collection of these miniature film sets. Um, and, and so, so once it became physical, it was, it was, it was great. And so that was kind of the, 
um, that was kind of the course of my of my practice in the in, you know kind of in, in, in the early 2000s in this transition from digital into, into physical as a way to not just to kind of participate in the art market. There was you know a lot of kind of artistic reasons for um, for doing those things, but you know it, it certainly led to being able to be collected, and then people were all excited to kind of like find out who was buying this kind of new media art, you know, and it was and it was a kind of exciting time. But there was always this question of like, what do you do? You know, what is there, is there, you know, how do you do this kind of natively digital? How does that, you know, how does that work? So that was kind of, that's kind of my artistic background. So then um, uh, fast forward, we're still in, we're still in the past. Um, we get to that second, here we go, uh, Bitcoin. So I found out about Bitcoin um, uh, in, in this, in this um, blog post on the, on the tech, um, uh, um, forum called Slashdot um, in the year uh, 2010. This is the first post about it. I was, you know, um, kind of following this community Slashdot. It's a really interesting place uh, for a lot of kind of intersections of tech and art and, or not so much art, but tech and culture and um, all these kinds of intersections. It was really great. Um, heard about Bitcoin, didn't really, didn't really think about it. Didn't really, it didn't really kind of connect with me very much, but it was, it was, you know, it seemed, it seemed interesting to me. So, um, a couple of years later, I re kind of found it again, rediscovered it, and this time I sat down and I read the paper. I read the Satoshi Nakamoto um, white paper, Be um, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And that really was uh, a turning point. That really was an incredible um, moment for me because I had spent my whole creative life dealing with, um, with networks, with software, with computers, um, and, 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 you know, and, and used to that, um, that, that, that kind of system. Um, and here was, this, here was this framework, this thing, this kind of collection of, of techniques, collection of, 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 of software, a bunch of different things kind of brought together in a really unique way um, that, that created something really um, special and really um, a, new, a new idea um, at the time. And so you know, the, the core of it, you know, we all kind of have this sense of, of, of Bitcoin now, but it really is pretty um, amazing. So, you know, here's, the, here's the, the, you know, the Bitcoin source code, you know, and so all of the code to Bitcoin is, um, is available, right? Every single, Part of it is uh, is accessible for us to for us to review. Um, the blockchain, the database itself, is totally there. You can just download it. You can run it. Whatever. It's 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 available. So the the, the software, the database, the whole history, everything is there. Everything is there. Everybody has it, 100%. Yet somehow, magically, my Bitcoin was mine, and your Bitcoin was yours. It was scarce, so it was kind of ubiquitous everywhere and it was scarce at the same time it was owned could be ownable um, and, and replicable but ownable at the same time and that was this kind of alchemy this kind of magic alchemy that i found um, in bitcoin when i really started digging into it in in the course of uh, in kind of 2012 and into 2013. and so for me as an artist with my background seeing that that insight of like it's everywhere but it's scarce at the same time i thought that is something that digital artists need. That is something that digital artists can use to solve problems that they have. It could be a way to create new possibilities um, and new, new options um, for artists. And so I thought that if it could happen with currency, there has got to be a way that it could happen for digital art too. But I didn't know how. Um, I didn't know how that was going to work. And so I began this kind of long process of research. Um, so here's a post, kind of representative post um, on the uh, Bitcoin Talk uh, forum uh, from 2013, which is kind of the big site where, where you know, where um, it was much tiny scene back then, um, but where the, where the crypto community was meeting um, and discussing and <laughs> whatever, I mean, flame warring, it was, you know, it was a very um, intense time. Um, but I, you know, was posing this question, you know, I'm using the blockchain as a method for assigning ownership of digital artworks, um, you know, from October of 2013. I say one big issue in the art, art world right now is buying and selling digital based media. Um, you know, while there are some interesting efforts made to address this issue, often artists resort to making some kind of physical output or embodiment of digital code object that can circulate more easily within the existing art market. I'm interested in developing a method or system where contractual ownership token or message can be embedded with a blockchain transaction. This way, artists working digitally can present their work in its native form on the internet, for example, yet still have a mechanism for selling it to a collector who would have a verifiable and secure way of showing ownership and transferring ownership to another party. That was the idea. Um, and so at this point in time, you know, so, so, so I'm right in the middle of kind of thinking about this, of trying to figure out how to kind of square these things together. Um, 
that that those efforts and those experiments culminated in um, the following year, in May of the following year, when I finally realized that I could use another blockchain, not Bitcoin, another blockchain called Namecoin that gave you an opportunity to create a little bit of metadata um, along with the chain um, and a certain kind of set of steps or actions um, that I could take to take together that would create a way to publish prove and assign ownership for a digital work. And that looks like this. So this is an example of the, from or this, this. So this is this is a transaction, the result of a transaction that I made that lives on the um, Namecoin blockchain. We're looking at a Namecoin Explorer, um, and it is it, it, it is a, tra a transaction that lives at this address, still lives there today, um, still sitting there. Um, and it um, has a number of components to it, but mostly it's just a plain prose-based statement. Um, I assert title to the file at the URL, blah, 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 with the creator's public announcement of its publishing at the URL, then here's a link to my Twitter, um, whose file, whose, the file whose hat, SHA-256 hash is this long number, um, uh, and then it's clipped off a little bit, um, type, uh, uh, is taken to be the file in question, title transfers to whoever controls this blockchain entry. This is, this is an NFT, and this is the first NFT. And so um, it's an NFT because it um, lives on a blockchain. It's a blockchain transaction. Um, it contains, um, it's, and it's a metadata record, right? So all of NFTs are, are metadata. Um, and so in the same way that your camera roll phone, your picture on your camera roll uh, might have metadata around the date, um, the GPS coordinates, maybe the camera settings, f-stop, whatever, all those sorts of things, color space, you know, cryptic things that most people don't know what they are, but they're all in there. That metadata record is separate from the file itself, but it's connected to the file, kind of comes from the file. So in the same way, this record that I created is connected to um, a piece of media, but it's separate from that piece of media. But it is um, uh, created in such a way that it can live in this public um, blockchain and it can be transferred from person to person um, in, 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 in a certain way um, that, that could assign ownership. And so um, I presented that idea um, along with my co-presenter, um, Anil Dash, um, at the New Museum um, with the, an event through the digital art organization Rhizome, um, and we called it Monograph. And, and it was this attempt to explain how digital art could be assigned ownership on a blockchain. Um, oh, and, and this is the artwork you saw it a second ago. There it is the first NFT. Um, nobody understood what I was talking about at all. It was, you know, we did a great job. Awesome. It was great. You can watch this video. Um, you know, we explain it, explain it really well, but it's nobody, nobody got it. We built a system, built all this stuff, tried to get people to kind of use it, whatever. Nothing, nothing, nothing happened. 2015, 2016, nobody got it. Nobody cared. Um, and then I kind of went on to other things. It was like, okay, all right, let's go, let's do some other stuff. Um, so in the meantime, the idea didn't die. The idea got picked up and it got rediscovered um, by other people. It got rediscovered by the Ethereum community, a different blockchain, not, name, not Bitcoin, not Namecoin, but Ethereum. And so some of the things that I was finding in, in, um, in, in Namecoin, like this little space where I could put this, this metadata together, or if I go back to my original post here, um, things that I was talking about, like, um, uh, 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 oh, anyway, I talk, about, I talk about a contract in there somewhere. Um, those things happen on, on Ethereum. That blockchain was designed around those things. So that technical basis was there in the Ethereum community. But also more importantly, money was in the Ethereum community because they invented in the meantime, between you know, in around 2016, 2017, this idea of decentralized finance or DeFi. And so DeFi is a whole other conversation, a whole other universe, a whole other panel to have, um, but it's, it's ways of using smart contracts um, on the Ethereum blockchain to re-engineer and reconstruct um, elements of our financial system, like lending, like borrowing, um, like um, derivatives, um, exchanges, uh, kind of broker relationships, things like that. And so um, that is, is, is a big universe. This protocol, the Uniswap protocol, is one of them, one of the most important ones. Um, and this, this whole ecosystem is still being built to this day, but it really started taking off in 2017, um, 2018. And it created a lot of money. Um, you know, these are 
you know, <laughs> you know the, the market caps of these different tokens that are, that are involved in this ecosystem. There was a lot of money that was generated um, during that time. And so the NFT boom um, that, that, we've, uh, that we are experiencing today is directly driven by this phenomenon of DeFi, of, of decentralized finance, the smart contracts on the Ethereum ecosystem, both from the kind of logic standpoint of the, of the um, smart contracts, but also from the money in people's um, wallets that, the, that, these, you know, that these protocols generated in terms of an, an expanding economy. Um, and they found a home finally, eventually, beginning really um, at scale in about, about a year ago, um, in, um, in NFTs. And so there was a new generation of platforms, the platforms that you hear about today that were all kind of created in this sort of, you know, kind of rediscovery period, you know, in, in kind of end of 2017, 2018, uh, like OpenSea, uh, like Foundation, uh, Nifty Gateway, um, Maker's Place. These, um, th those were kind of the, you know, the kind of initial um, platforms that that um, that that were that were selling NFTs that caught this caught this post DeFi this new wave this big this big wave, um, and so and so those were the platforms. And then the projects. So again, are the you know and, you, and you, mostly if you've paid any attention to this world at all, you've heard about those you've heard about those platforms. Uh, and and then the projects. You know the, the the actual NFT projects that that you know that that, that rode that wave. You've probably also heard of if you've paid any attention at all to this world. So that's um, things like uh, crypto. Punks, you know, is, is the canonical um, early um, early piece, and, and Crypto Kitties, um, you know, and, and now of course there's there's many many more, and and then the main artist that everyone now knows of is Beeple because that was that was the huge that was the huge sale, and so all that stuff happened well after my experiments and and and, and on the back of on the back of DeFi um, and 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 on the back of the protocols that the Ethereum world um, put together that the Ethereum world built. Um, and uh, and they do a really good job, and so um, and so and so that's kind of the world that we're in now. Um, now I could spend a lot of time <laughs> talking because there's an infinity of details um, inside these, um, uh, you know, in, inside just the ecosystem today um, around minting, uh, around um, you know what you know kind of side chains, layer two chains, what you know different different kinds of chains. That kind of thing, but I want to look past that a little bit and talk about um, what I see kind of coming in the future. And it's not even really the future; it's kind of like maybe tomorrow future, you know, because things are kind of move so quickly um, in this world. The, the the things that I'm talking about are kind of already happening, but I think that we're, they're going to be more and more uh, prevalent, you know, as as we go along. Um, and so I want to talk about a couple of those things. So um, let me go back to my uh, my notes here. Past um, future, yeah. So my first future thing is um, generative works. Let me uh, clear that up, there we go. Um, so I think generative um, NFTs and generative uh, concepts um, are, uh, are, really, are, are gonna be, are, are emerging as a really important thing um, in the NFT world. So, so, so what does that mean? What does generative mean? So um, what I mean by that is that the, uh, the world of NFTs um, are on-chain smart contracts. And so um, smart contracts are, you know, basic software programs that live on chain. The most important one, this isn't part of my slide, but I can pull it up, uh, erc721.org, I think. Nope, that's not it. Oh, I can't. You see, this is why I pull them up ahead of time, because I can't type and talk at the same time. There we go. Okay. Um, ERC-721. So this is the most important contract in the world of NFTs uh, because this is the smart contract that is that is you know become the standard. ERC stands for um, Ethereum Reference Contract, um, and uh, and and this is the, the whole ecosystem is built on this. This is literally the source code for it, um, written in Solidity. Um, it's very tiny. There's not much to it. It's it's just this simple little um, little shell of of an application. Um, it can get expanded, it can get added onto, but this is the basic um, element. Um, this was written as part of the CryptoKitties project back at the end of 2017, so it's been around for a long, long time. Um, and it's super, super simple, right? It only, um, you know, it only can, basically it can transfer, um, it can, you know, kind of have an owner thing, you know, see who, who, kind of who the owner is. Um, and it and it has a um, uh, and and it can transfer that it can delegate that responsibility to transfer to someone else. That's how the marketplaces work, um, and that's kind of it. Um, that that the that's kind of it. Um, and so the the 
and then I got to pop up there if I should go away. Um, so what I mean by generative is all kinds of other ways that these smart contracts can be extended on the blockchain where other kinds of things can happen. And so it's not just the NFT contract itself, but it's um, other kinds of software like functions that can live um, on the blockchain. And so let me show you a couple of those. Um, the most important one, the biggest one going on right now is this one called Art Blocks. Um, and so Art Blocks is, um, has been around for a couple of years. It's a great project, really popular project. Um, and in this, you know, how, how this works is artists um, write source code, right? Gener you know, source code um, that, 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 that's an artwork. And so they're, they're kind of tapping into a long um, history, you know, pre-blockchain um, history of artists writing code that is, that is artworks. Um, and so in this case, you, you create your code and you kind of memorialize it um, on chain. Um, it's there on chain. And then when people acquire tokens for that, um, uh, you know, of, of that artwork, and it's usually done in, in, in an edition format, um, they kind of buy one, one pass through that software. It might draw some kind of picture when I mean, you can see examples of it here, right? So these are, these are generative codes, but each, each picture that you see is just one instance of software that could produce other kinds of flavors. Um, you know, the closest, you know, the thing that you would have seen that most, um, it's closest to this in terms of function is, is a screensaver. Um, I personally think screensavers are vastly underappreciated. They're pretty amazing pieces of software. There was no other place for them in a pre-Bitcoin and a pre-blockchain era than just kind of giving them away as kind of things to show on your screen. Um, now with blockchain, there can be uh, a way to um, create property around them. Uh, you know, so, but, but, but that's another conversation, but in art blocks, um, this idea of a stored program on chain that produces a graphical output that someone could own as a token um, is a really, is a really great idea, a really popular idea. Um, and, and, and that's kind of one example of a, of a generative um, artwork. Um, another one is uh, this piece um, by the artist Mad Dog Jones uh, that was sold recently at Philips. And this is a, a really great piece, a really interesting one. Um, it's an NFT. Um, the NFT has media associated with it, which is just this kind of little video file um, that you, you know, kind of, you know, there's, there's kind of, this is kind of low res, or not low res, but kind of retro um, office photocopier. But all the, all the real action for the artwork happens on the blockchain. And so here, um, as, as an extension to the um, ERC-721 contract, as an extension to the primary token contract, is this whole other nested set of contracts that, um, that create this replication function. And so it takes um, properties that are um, uh, kind of pertinent that describe this artwork, and it creates copies of them, like, you know, in the photocopier is a kind of metaphor um, for that. But there's opportunities for that to to fail and to and to break, and so it's spinning off these kind of um, these kind of sub tokens that are sometimes exact copies and sometimes faulty copies um, of, of the original, and it has this lifespan of uh, creating these copies um, over time, and that's all living on the in the in the distributed ledger of the um, Ethereum blockchain, um, and that's a really cool idea to kind of have this sort of abstract. Uh, process that's that's um, you know that, that that's happening that um, you know and, and is living um, on the blockchain. Um, not to be outdone by uh, Mad Dog Jones, um, we did a project that has um, the, 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 a generative project this summer. Also, that I think is pretty um, is pretty interesting um, and, and pretty important. Um, we made a piece uh, called Quantum Leap um, that uh, has both on chain and off chain um, generative. Um, capabilities. So um, what, what this is, um, is a website. Um, you go to quantumleap.mccoyspace.com. Um, you don't see much, you see a kind of info screen. But if you're a token holder, if you own one of those tokens, and you connect your MetaMask wallet, now I do not have these tokens on this computer, so I can't even show you, I can only simulate it. But if I were to, to um, connect this, uh, this um, uh, uh, connect my wallet that had those tokens, this page would change and it would be generating this artwork that corresponds to the token that you have. Um, it looks something like, like this uh, before we locked it behind our, 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 our uh, website. Um, and so this is a, a kind of a, a example instance of the kind of output that our generative software is producing. So it has this kind of kaleidoscopic effect 
um, this kind of kind of digital painting, but the parameters that describe, say, for example, this shape in the center um, and the overall palette of it um, are determined by the token that you have. And over time, as a collector, uh, and this is kind of speeding up the process, this piece will fade um, into a grayscale. Um, and so each, each stage has a kind of lifespan to it. Um, and it goes from full color into a black and white stage. Um, at the end of that black and white stage, it can be reborn back into color and this shape in the middle um, changes. It goes from a three-sided shape to now we see it as a four-sided shape. Um, this four-sided shape also has a lifespan that eventually goes to grayscale um, and, 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 comes to a, and comes to a stop. At the end of that period, it will be reborn again into color as a five-sided shape. And so this piece progresses from a three-sided to four to five to six to seven to eight sides, all the way up to 20-sided shape um, at, um, at the end. And I can kind of preview that by jumping to the end um, and you get to something that looks like this at the end. So now in, in our software, this process takes about three years. So it's a long-term um, evolution. And as, you, as it progresses over time, the owner gets additional tokens that can present those different stages. So if you buy the three-sided shape, you're going to have a token that produces offspring um, along the way as it evolves to a four-sided, to a five-sided. You get these tokens that represent these earlier stages. So you have this collection, you have this artwork that kind of evolves over time that you get to live with, but you have additional NFT tokens that, can, that you can connect back to to kind of pull up these earlier states. Now those are NFTs, you could choose to sell them. So there's a kind of secondary market concept that's kind of built into it, um, but it's still all kind of within this whole kind of generative uh, visual concept that we set up with, um, with this work. Um, and so there's a ton, 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 these are just kind of scratching the surface of, of, of generative use cases in, um, in NFTs, but it's gonna be a really, a really big deal. Um, next up is uh, community. And so NFTs are going to drive community um, in a big, big way um, as, as kind of markers of community and as kind of definitions of community. Um, and there's a couple of um, projects to, uh, to point to. Um, since it's the artist centric one and I'm you know, kind of tooting my own horn, I'm gonna start with um, a project that we did um, with the Whitney Museum um, pretty early on actually in this terms of kind of NFTs and community um, a couple of years ago, uh, pre-pandemic um, in, in 2018 and into 2019, this project called Public Key, Private Key. Um, and so just to describe this project a little bit, we, um, we, we, made a, uh, we made a 16 millimeter film. We wanted to make a media object, but it was you know, something that was an object. It was this physical object. So we made this um, 16 millimeter film of this woman walking up this long stairwell, this kind of short film. And we donated it to the Whitney. Um, they were happy to take our donation, all good. Um, but we said to them, we want to create, um, we, first we asked them, do people ever, how does donation credit work? And do those credits ever change? Can somebody change the name of who donated the work after the fact? They thought about that for a while and they said, yeah, There's, they pointed to some different examples. And then we said, are there multiple donors? How many you know, donors names are there? And they went back and researched that and they thought, oh yeah, there's, there can be kind of a list of donors. So we said, we wanna create a list of 50 names of people who are credited as being donors of this work after the fact. Um, and we want to, and, and they said, okay. And so we created a token for that, that represented that donation credit. Um, and so we issued that token, there was a, a mechanism that we issued that and people were able to kind of trade that um, back and forth in different ways for a period of time until at the end of, of when they kind of you know, locked it down and, and, and finalized it, kind of like a game of musical chairs, these were the people that, that held onto that token at the end and are listed as the donors um, for that artwork. And so this is an example of a kind of token driven community because these are a group of people that kind of organize themselves by, by, by nature of having that token around a certain kind of activity or a certain thing. In this case, it was museum donation turned out to be pretty appealing to people. Um, but there's a lot more stuff going on in, in, um, with this idea. Um, the most important one or the biggest one is this thing called um, FWB or Friends with Benefits. And, and, it's a, and, it's, and it's a kind of sprawling uh, social club that, um, that 
that talks, you know, that, 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 that has all kinds of different events and all kinds of different um, activities um, that, that, that it supports. Um, and you have to have an NFT um, to do it. Um, and then lastly, um, is this uh, DAO called Flamingo DAO. And, and Flamingo, and, and so we can, in DAOs, whole other conversation, whole other panel to have been talking about DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations. But the Flamingo DAO is um, an NFT centric DAO that is using tokens as a way to define membership of their, of their um, community, but they're also a collecting community. They're also kind of collecting NFTs. So it's an NFT driven community collecting NFTs. Um, and, 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 and they're really, um, kind of leaders in the space. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about in my uh, speed run here is the next thing in the future is rights. And now all the, all the lawyers can perk their ears up. Um, <laughs> now we're speaking your language. Um, and so rights. So um, my, my um, after I, you know, my company Monograph, you know, which, which, you know, kind of no one was interested in 2015, 2016, we wrote, um, we decided to write some patents. And so we wrote this patent, um, rights transfers using blockchain transactions. And I think it's a pretty important patent. Um, and so, um, because this idea of rights and on-chain rights is gonna be a big deal. That's how the rest of the world is going to come on chain. That's how everything else is going to come on chain. I and mean, obviously in the world of creative media, that means music and film and, and TV and things like that. You know, of course, um, there's a world of rights in, 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 in you know, in many other spheres as well too, but I'm focusing right now just on, on, on kind of how it pertains to media. Um, and so, so um, you know, so with Monograph, which has kind of come back from the dead and it's kind of now up and up, uh, you know, kind of charging ahead, um, doing a lot of really cool things, um, a, a rights perspective and an on-chain rights um, technology opens up a lot, of, a lot of really cool possibilities. So here's just one. Um, so this is a, a, a collaboration that just recently happened between us and uh, the musician Timbaland. Um, around a set of NFTs that he wanted to produce. And so in this case, they are um, stem tracks to unreleased music that he's going to be releasing next year. So um, he has a set of songs that are gonna be part of this EP, but before he released them on Spotify and whatever in the usual way, he owns the rights to these things. He took the songs and he broke them up into their individual tracks, the, the elements that come together to make a song during the recording process. And each one of those is an NFT. Um, and so people have the opportunity to, to buy these NFTs in ways that they could then, you know, that they could then remix them. So here's one. So, um, so, so, that, I mean, so it's an FT. Um, my wife and I made the artwork for these things. Um, but the most important thing is because we have, you know, through uh, negotiations with him and, 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 and his team, we could express on chain the rights necessary to allow people to create remixes from these. And so um, we've just kind of released this first set of them, but already there's people that are um, you know, people are super excited about the access that, that this kind of thing can um, enable for them. Um, and they're already kind of creating kind of mashups and, and, and that's kind of starting a whole, um, a whole pathway, a whole kind of conversation. So I kind of throw this out there here at the end, just to kind of show quickly one um, uh, kind of emerging project um, that, that is facilitated through rights on chain. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, is going to be um, also super, super important um, moving forward. So, you know, so just to kind of like summarize, right, the whole thing starts, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this fact that it starts as, you know, from the artist's perspective, literally in an art museum, literally at the new museum, you know, kind of from the world of, of digital arts, NFTs emerge to solve specific problems for artists. And so I think that, you know, the, 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 the topic of this, uh, this whole conference is NFTs, you know, are they a fad? They're not fads because this idea of, of, of a sovereign digital property um, is just so, it's just too important. And, and so whether Bitcoin goes up or down or Ethereum goes up or down or kind of whatever happens with that, the idea of being able to own something in the way that, 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 that NFTs can facilitate um, is just really, uh, is, is, is just really too powerful. It's too important. Um, and it's going to persist um, in the future. Who knows what the market will do? You know, will the prices for any given NFT go up or down? Who knows? There's tons of crappy NFTs, you know, it's, it's all kind of insane, but the core idea is super, super important. 
and the kinds of things that it'll facilitate that I've kind of alluded to here quickly, generative things, you know, kind of software driven processes, um, community defined things, and then and rights articulation are just kind of some of the things that are going to be um, uh, coming forward as this technology um, develops. Um, so I'm a few minutes over my time, so I'm gonna have to stop there, but um, I'll be around for, uh, I think in the Q and A after, and um, thanks a lot. Kevin, thank you. Uh, and I think we could all listen longer. Um, and I'm sorry that you don't have the time. Uh, we, don't, we didn't give you the time, I should say, today. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, we're going to go right into panel two uh, with Megan No, who's a partner at Prior Cashman, uh, uh, Sarah Odenkirk, who is a partner at Callan Debates, Abrahams and Shepherd. And Yoyo Shinori, who is the executive director of the Chris Burden Estate and the Nancy Rubin Studio. Uh, and so they're going to talk. Uh, I know that a lot of our viewers are aware uh, that the visual arts have been such a strong, um, strong motivator. And as Kevin just said, really the start of the NFT uh, phenomenon. And so uh, they're going to discuss the role that art has played and what uh, challenges they see in their practice uh, and in with their clients um, and, and how it is playing out in the arts. So I will hand it over to Megan. Are you starting us off, Megan? I am, and I'm actually not going to do bios with for my esteemed colleagues because, as you said, um, they're in the materials. But I'll say I'm so honored to be presenting with both Yayoi and Sarah this morning, and we're all grateful to you, Pippa, and to Columbia for organizing this opportunity for us. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, so let's see. Can people see that? Great. Okay. So. Um, we are here today to talk about visual arts and NFTs, obviously. I think that the audience will find there's a lot of crossover between the things we're gonna be covering in this panel and some of the visuals and projects that Kevin just specifically referenced, as well as some of the legal concepts that came up in the first panel. We didn't coordinate all those panels, but I think it speaks well to the fact that these are the right issues for us to be discussing, that they're coming up on multiple panels. So as a foundational point, and also not to rehash what Stu beautifully presented in the first panel, I think most copyright lawyers here will be in agreement that a digital work or a digital reproduction of a physical work can be copyrightable. And just as with a painting, the transfer of ownership of a copy of a copyrighted work will not, in the absence of a written assignment, transfer copyright in the underlying work to the purchaser. So that's the same as with the analog world. But some other aspects of a purchaser's default rights under the Copyright Act don't necessarily seem to track for digital works. And the licensing terms that we are seeing are all over the map. So there is some uncertainty in the art marketplace as a result of that lack of uniformity. Other aspects of transactions for visual artwork as recorded on the blockchain, which as Stu again presented is a permanent and transparent ledger, may afford benefits to artists that exceed the scope of the Copyright Act, particularly with respect to so-called resale royalties. So we're hoping today to dig in a bit on some different perspectives from within the art world specifically on how NFTs may be valuable to harness new potential for revenue and for control, as well as some of the challenges that both creators and copyright attorneys are facing as we brave this new horizon. So Yayoi, I would like to start with you. Can you give our audience a basic primer on NFTs that relate to visual artwork and the growing market for that category? Yeah, and thanks so much, Megan, for that. Thanks, Megan, Sarah, for your collaboration as we put together this panel. And also thank you, Pippa, Samara, Ramiz, Benjamin, everyone at Columbia Law School for having us. And as Megan mentioned, some of this has already been covered by Stu, but wanted to sort of have a primer on it as it specifically relates to visual artwork. Why? Love this framing question because actually, um, Everyone seems to think that they're often using the same definition, but to be honest, I'm not always 100% sure whether we're talking to artists, 
engineers, devs, collectors, etc. So what is the NFT being transacted? And for purposes of our panel today, we're going to be defining it as the token, which is unique data that represents the artwork within essentially a chain of references. Stu already brought this slide up, as did Kevin as well. Uh, this is Beeple's every days. The first 5,000 days sold at Christie's for $69.3 million. Uh, so on the left of your screen, you're seeing the digital artwork that Beeple created. But really, what you're seeing on the right is the NFT, which is what, which essentially looks like alphabet soup, right? What does it contain? It contains the metadata for the work, which is like a tombstone caption for visual artwork. It has the hash the alphanumeric chain that specifically identifies the work. There's also a hyperlink to the hosting space that has the underlying digital file. And in addition, any written code that executes commands under preset conditions, what we like to refer to as the smart contract with scare quotes, a pin on that later. Question otherwise is whether or not the surrounding terms and conditions on the platform also apply, and we will get to that later as well. So again, for framing purposes, what is not the NFT? The NFT is not the digital artwork. What's copyrightable here? You know, and it seems that there was a robust conversation in panel one, but we're talking about things like the underlying code. The code itself could be copyrighted. It might be a thin layer of copyright, but there's copyright. Also the creative digital assets as well. Before I turn it back to Megan though, because we are specifically talking about the visual art world and how NFTs relate, wanted to talk a little bit about how NFTs as a digital medium either mirrors or doesn't mirror the traditional legacy art world. How does it mirror? Point number one, it pushes the frontiers of types of new media art, right? And Kevin kindly uh, had been talking to us about his legendary work many, many years ago, um, which makes him an expert in the field. But there are many other digital artists as well who have been consistently utilizing new media as a form of expression. And now uh, in some ways, maybe the field of NFT art is changing so rapidly that maybe what we're actually waiting for is the art historical contextualization to past forms of new media art, like digital art, internet art, post-internet art, or what have you. Point number two as to how it mirrors the traditional legacy art world. NFTs are often considered digital certificates of authenticity on the blockchain. So a comparison to certificates and instruction-based artwork, the slide that you see here is Felix Gonzalez Torres, an example of his candy spill. Candy spills are where an owner gets a certificate of ownership and display instructions, and the display instructions are often variable. Right. For this particular candy spill, it can be a corner piece, as you are seeing it here, or it can be interpreted as an endless supply in a carpet form, more horizontal. Right. Moving on to another example of uh, certificate-based ownership work. Next slide. Um, the idea of certificate-based ownership of conceptual projects is not new. Uh, this is Eve Klein in the late 50s, where he created zones of immaterial pictorial sensibility. And what this was, was Klein sold certificates of purchase that were bought with gold, and then the buyer could trigger a performative ritual of sorts where Klein would throw away 50% of the gold into the sun while the buyer would burn the check. So there is both a physical manifestation of the work as well as a performative ritual that is undertaken with the consent of the artist and the buyer. One perhaps negative um, uh, point about NFT art and the NFT community um, that mirrors the traditional legacy art world, I would be uh, remiss if I did not 
uh, put a little pin on this where Art Tactic recently came out with research that tracked sales across 21 months on auction houses and platforms of NFT sales with the result of 55% of these sales stemming from only 16 artists representing a turnover of about $260 million with Grimes being the only female presenting artist uh, in the top 10 of those sales. And in the same research, female presenting people account for, or a self-identifying female presenting people account for only 5% of the market sales on Nifty Gateway during the same period. Back to you, Megan. Thank you so much. So there are some really important equity issues there, but before we dig in on that, let's circle back on the issue of copyrightability for a moment. In our first panel, there were some panelists who were discussing challenges around um, machine generated works to a little bit of, of an extent, or I saw that as a question in the Q&A. Um, and that may be applicable in the context of PFP projects, profile pic projects, in which a set of attributes like hair or mouths or dog faces or cats or whatever are created and then fed into a processor or an algorithm to generate X number of unique combinations. But I also want, and, and we'll get to some PFP projects in a, in a little bit in this presentation. But for a second, I also just wanted to think about other copyrightability challenges. Um, and again, you'll see some of the same projects that Kevin had included in his presentation. How might copyrightability of visual works be impacted by the qualities of being generative or dynamic? Um, and I know that this also harkens back to the 2019 Kernikan Conference um, for a panel that Sarah's partner Nancy spoke on, if I'm not mistaken, when we focused on copyrightability. So this slide is the Mad Dog Jones project, which creates children, and I think Kevin spoke to that. Um, this is a project by a client of mine, Slime Sunday. It's called Growth. Individual squares of this work are replaced by the artist through the back end over time as his um, social media profiles experience events of censorship. The next project we have on the slide is Quantum Leap, which Kevin also spoke to that he and Jennifer created. That, and this is a project that literally changes over time. And then this project is a project by, if I'm not mistaken, clients of Sarah's. And the crystals here change up to seven times over the first two months, depending on the wallet contents before they're fixed. So we're seeing all of these kinds of projects that the artist may not know what the ultimate visual outcome is going to be, or that are responsive to their environment or to tokens or to other triggering factors. So Sarah, maybe you can walk us through some of the questions around copyrightability challenges there. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you, Megan. And I will not uh, extend all of this with, with the various thank yous and just tag on to Yayoi and Megan's thank yous to everyone for being here today. Um, so copyright law requires that an expression in order for it to be protectable is fixed in a tangible medium of expression that is now known or later developed from which it can be perceived, reproduced or otherwise communicated either directly or indirectly with the aid of a machine or device. Clearly in the case of generative art, we have a uh, creative expression. This is fixed in a tangible medium. Um, so if the generative art is being created by an AI algorithm or an artificial intelligence algorithm, the question becomes whether the original artist uh, can claim the resulting work or whether the AI machine that claims it, whether it's the AI machine that claims the ownership. Um, however, the courts uh, and copyright law have been very clear that only humans, as we can see from this slide of the monkey selfie, um, only humans can maintain copyright. So we're left with either the work being owned by the artist who initiated the project or the work immediately entering the public domain. So it might be a slightly different conversation if we look at the works less as generative works emanating from uh, the uh, artist's original, uh, unique original. Um, for instance, the AI's take on the artist's work, uh, instead of viewing the generative piece as a series of works represented by a conceptual plan created by the artist. 
So this really goes back to these much older conversations around conceptual art that Yayoi started us off with um, around what is protectable. So for instance, did Solowitz's work become more protectable when he decided that the manifestation of the instructions had to be executed by his studio? So taking a look at that interplay between the instructions and the execution might be a little bit helpful here in, uh, in working through some of these issues. NFTs in particular, provide a really interesting and fertile environment in which to consider the packaging and selling of conceptual works uh, that previously defied this mechanism um, for being neatly collected. And we'll certainly talk a little bit more about, um, about all of these issues as well. Um, yeah, and plus one to what Sarah just said, really, because coming from a purely art background, I think I do want to prioritize the artist intent, right? So even if it is generated by machine combinations through this generative work, like for example, Kevin's quantum leap, at the end of the day, I think it should be copyrighted back to the artist, especially if they are architecting this plan that results in these tangible fixed forms of expression. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think we didn't promise answers to a lot of these questions, but I think they're such important questions um, to be thinking about as this space develops. So putting aside copyrightability issues for a moment and assuming that I'm an artist, my digital work is eligible for protection, what assurances do I as a copyright holder have that somebody isn't minting a token that references my copyrighted work? Is that even okay for them to do? Uh, first of all, no, <laughs> it's not okay. It should absolutely be considered a violation of the exclusive rights of copyright holders, as you mentioned in your introduction. Um, the DMCA safe harbor position, which most platforms um, uh, allow for the artist to take down um, any, any uh, infringing works, um, can definitely be a tool that we use here. But of course, that doesn't remove the work from the blockchain. I think this was referenced in the, the panel earlier. Um, Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I just wanted to comment on DMCA. Right. That works well when it's an actual neutral platform, an ISP, but it can, became, it, it can become a game of whack-a-mole. And there are also situations where somebody is DMCA'd, so to speak, there's a request and their material is taken off a platform or another new, neutral content provider site, but then they go out and create their own site or marketplace to host that material. And I think we'll get to an example of that later in the presentation. So I just, again, wanna kind of put a pin in that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it is a really important distinction because in the traditional market, we've relied on um, existing licensing agents such as the Artist Rights Society to help police these unauthorized works of, um, uh, the, the, that are um, misappropriated. Um, and while it's much harder in this marketplace, especially because it's moving so quickly with new platforms popping up every day, there's at least a model in the traditional art world uh, for this kind of supportive service in, in policing some of this. So what will be interesting to see, and I really think that NFTs eventually could, event, uh, could provide a way to verify and track rights, um, but we still need to deal with some of the garbage in garbage out problems meaning that the information we can look at is only as good as the information that's been put onto the blockchain. Um, and then of course, there's the additional challenge of having to place not only the images that are misappropriated, but the ability to use embedded computer coding to confuse matters further. So I stayed up very late um, recently looking into the whole sleep minting issue because this is just a fascinating area. Um, and this is where a developer can make it look like a digital asset has been created by, say, the original artist by minting an asset into the artist's wallet and then immediately transferring it out to make it look like the NFT um, was created by the artist, but obviously lives somewhere else. So now not only do we have to look at potentially unauthorized images uh, being used based on the aesthetic values that we're seeing, but also looking at the underlying code creating the NFTs which are pointing to the assets to make sure that it's not originating from an, under, uh, from an unauthorized source. In this regard, I think AI could be very helpful in the future as a way to search. Obviously, humans are not gonna be able to have the necessary speed um, or ability to look as deep, um, as quickly as is necessary in order to police this. 
So AI could be very useful in being able to verify the underlying codes. Um, I know that there are a number of organizations currently that are working on these sorts of processes. Um, and so as, soon as, as that evolves, we'll definitely see some advancement in um, automating this market monitoring in identifying similar images, as well as potentially infringing underlying codes. Um, so, you know, although these methods have not yet proven to be effective enough, uh, there's a certain amount of nuanced judgment that's going to need to continue to be applied in this area. Um, it's definitely a very complex landscape. Uh, so yes. Megan mentioned uh, whack-a-mole, uh, and, and it definitely most certainly is the case, right, particularly for artwork as well as for digital artwork as well. And of course, Artists' Rights Society and its other sister affiliates are a great ally to artists who are members to those organizations to help monitor and also potentially police those instances of uh, not permitted copying. But even then, it's incredibly impossible to monitor all uses online. And this is even the case, obviously, with physical pieces of artwork as well. So for example, Chris Burden's Urban Light created in 2008 a large site-specific installation that is permanently installed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's really become, for better or for worse, one of the most Instagrammable spots in LA and also in some ways has come to become an iconic landmark, a stand-in for LA. And so in some ways, as the estate, we've had to take a quasi-legal practical approach to try to identify the practical distinction between permissible uh, personal use and impermissible, unpermitted potential copyright infringement. And so, for example, on your left, you see a personal Instagram photo of somebody enjoying being in front of the sculpture, being in front of LA, letting people know that they are enjoying being in LA, uh, which is most likely permissible, at least from the estate's point of view, versus on the right, the copyright lawsuit we're waging in Indonesia of a selfie amusement park that has what is called Love Light, a selfie sculpture that looks substantially similar to Urban Light and for which the amusement park is charging emission fees for people to visit to, uh, to take pictures in front of that sculpture. But again, these distinctions can be very difficult to parse and there's also impracticalities to the legal processes that are available. And what are those legal processes and what are those impracticabilities? Impracticalities of registration to aid enforcement through lawsuits is one area. For example, if you're working on a 10,000 avatar drop, it's both costly and very time consuming to submit 10,000 expedited applications in advance. Other challenges uh, with enforceability include things like the anonymity of infringers, because a lot of purchasers currently are transacting through obscure digital wallet IDs. And because we are, of course, in the Digiverse, there are uh, multi-jurisdictional issues as well regarding market activity. So if there are impracticabilities on the legal processes side of things, what to do? I think in some ways there are still extra legal tactics that artists and members of the community can utilize. And I think these are quite interesting. It is the power of the call out culture, for example, if used for good. And of course, relying on the power of the community to attempt to create a leveling and, and, and a democratic playing field for everybody. Awesome, thank you so much, Yayoi. Just going back to some of those practical challenges to tease that out a little bit further, um, as you mentioned for profile picture projects with 10,000 avatars, it might be cost prohibitive to register all of those things in advance, but it also might be cost prohibitive to conduct a substantial similarity use for e a substantial similarity um, analysis for each of those infringing items, particularly where you might have 
elements that were taken from one project and mixed through that algorithm or generative program with other elements. It might be really clear when all someone has done is literally flipped the orientation from left to right, which is what happened with the punks and then the funks. Um, and this also is an example of a project that was DMCA'd and then moved on to its own independent decentralized or anonymous marketplace. Um, but I think that analysis is not so similar for other projects where it's not just a simple vertical orientation flip. On the left is an, a work that was created in 2016 by a digital artist who goes by Pixel Hans. And on the right is one of the PFPs from a 10,000 PFP drop by um, a group of NFT creators called Chubbies. And those two, I think we probably could take a poll here and most people would agree that it looks substantially similar. Um, but on the top right of this slide, you can see that when PFP projects are launched on OpenSea, OpenSea does this really cool thing where it creates different categories of attributes and will tell you exactly how rare some of those attributes are. Um, but on the left is Pixel Hans's original 16 characters. So you can see there's a dog, a frog, a pig, what have you. Um, but then if you open up these attributes within OpenSea, you can see that those attributes were combined for this project with other attributes that Pixel Hans did not create, an apple, an avocado, a banana, what have you. And so we get these Frankenstein mashups of the characters. And I'm, I don't know about you guys, but other practicing attorneys in the room, I, I don't want to go through 10,000 characters and determine on a case-by-case -case basis how many of them are substantially similar. Um, I think we also can glaze over this because we're short on time today, but I think there are some really interesting evolving fair use precedent, particularly in the visual art space and in the tech space, and I'm not sure those two sets of precedent are fully aligned. The Google v. Oracle decision seemed to suggest that a media shift in and, in and of itself lends itself perhaps to a fair use finding, whereas the Goldsmith Warhol case seemed to suggest that in the visual arts context where you have a one-to-one -one type of use, it's a portrait of a person and it's being the secondary user is using it to create another portrait of the same person, um, that that's not going to be a fair use in the absence perhaps of drawing upon multiple images like a collage. So it will be interesting to see how all of that shakes out in the NFT context. And, and Sarah, I know you had a, a thought on that as well. No, I just, I, I do think that it will be interesting to see how this um, concept of favoring collage translates into the NFT space. And so much of what's going on is in fact remixing and um, creating a digital equivalent of a collage. Yep. Okay, so switching gears for a moment, all three of us are so privileged to represent a number of living artists who are engaged with rights management, both from an IP perspective and a market control standpoint. So I'd like to hear from both of you on the issue of how NFTs may present opportunities from an artist equity standpoint, including vis-a-vis -vis the important diversity and representation issues that Yayoi alluded to with those interesting statistics at the beginning of our talk. And I also saw some important comments, um, including from Sandhya Jane Patel, an ex Christie's colleague in our chat box earlier this morning. Yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, and of course, we're talking to a group of lawyers and legal experts here, so we all know this, but the codified law is conservative and it is always behind what is happening in reality and of course, what is now happening in the Digiverse, right? So the law as it stands in the US and in most other countries is outdated when it comes to offering protections for artists, both in terms of what is protected and how. And I think Andre in his first panel had some remarks about that from a UK perspective as well. But again, another example, for example, Japan has a very narrowly prescribed fair use concept to the point where many legal experts in Japan actually say there is actually no fair use uh, or the concept of fair use uh, in Japan as opposed to jurisdiction like in the United States. 
And then in the United States, regarding artist resale rights, both at the federal level and in, in certain states, like, for example, uh, in California, um, these resale concepts either don't or already didn't in the past tense work. And so, uh, and I think Adrian was commenting as well regarding rights, then what can we do if the law doesn't protect us, then we have to go to things like private contracts, like contracting between specific parties. And so what you're seeing on the screen is Seth Siegelob's Artist Reserve Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement. It is one such alternative widely respected, but for whatever reason, um, hasn't necessarily been widely adopted. And I think some parts of the Siegelob contract might actually be potentially solved by putting it on chain. For example, notices affixed to the work, that could be metadata as a tombstone caption within the NFT, the provenance of transfer being recorded, of course, that is one of the things specifically that is supposed to happen when a buyer purchases an NFT and then sells it to the next purchaser. And then of course, hopefully future owners abiding by the preset conditions and terms in the smart contract. Right, so the key here is that through these so-called smart contracts, i.e. executable code functions, the payment of royalties on downstream NFT sales is automated. And this came up in our first keynote and I think it will keep coming up. But to reframe that within the art market, it's what's really important is that it doesn't rely on human fidelity as is the case for works that are transacted in the physical realm and for which a contract provision may not work perfectly because in an opaque market, you might not know when your buyer resells something versus on the blockchain, it's transparent. And if the code is functioning properly, the payment is automatic. Right. So what we're seeing is that there are really two ways to address the limitations of the code comprising the NFTs. Um, one is the terms of service on the marketplace platform, which we'll talk a little bit about. And the other, of course, is an old fashioned PDF, English language or whatever language contract that is attached to the NFT as a way to clarify the structure and expectations. So in order for this to have um, real impact, NFT buyers need to be aware of the, the um, uh, importance of these terms of service and to be checking to see if there are additional, term, additional terms attached to the NFTs by carefully reading the metadata. Right, so just to chime in on that there with respect to this, the, the, the different options here. There's the smart contract itself, and some companies are doing excellent user experience focused work to ensure that the smart contracts translate to or are readable as plain English before and after the purchase, including on Etherscan, and hopefully Kevin can speak to, to this a little bit in our Q&A after. Um, but there are also these separate contracts that can be linked to linked from the sales site for a particular NFT. So on the screen is a project I was privileged to work on. It's um, a virtual reality interactive environment that is that is being sold by the use of an NFT as a certificate of title and ownership. And this is the supplemental terms and conditions that are linked from the OpenSea, or sorry, in this case, it's super rare platform where the NFT is being offered for sale because those buyer side generic platform conditions may not speak to all of the issues that the artists here wanted to address or the type of license they want to provide to their purchaser. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the kinds of supplemental benefits that can be managed through the NFT sale documentation packages, so to speak, including creating requirements or artist statements or similar. How can we go about some of that, Sarah? Sure. Well, as you just pointed out, um, using separate contracts that are attached to the NFT, um, though it might be helpful to include some description and information in the metadata to alert buyers as to the category or general direction of that attached content. And that's um, certainly happening more and more now uh, through different um, options on, on various platforms. So. <clears throat> The supplemental benefits that, that are articulated in these attached agreements go beyond just protecting artist rights, but they also provide uh, a stage for extending commentary and the additional 
um, conceptual layers of the project um, to, to be included on top of the visuals that you see within the, uh, the visual files that are connected to the NFT. So for instance, here, we have a project that I was privileged to work on with artist Nancy Baker Cahill. This is Contract Killers. Um, and this project was really born out of a concern, both for the quick shift away from last year's scrutiny on systemic exclusion and social justice, as well as the lack of attention to uh, the environmental impact of blockchain uh, projects that are at least those projects that are minted on the proof of work systems, which we are not going to spend a lot of time going over today in terms of the, the technical aspects of that. Anyway, this project consisted of four different dissolving AR handshakes located in front of the Hall of Justice, the City Hall, and a pile of cash. And then this one in front of a blank wall, um, each representing different broken social contracts. So in addition to these visuals, we attached a collector agreement. Uh, which is pictured here, at least the first few paragraphs. Um, and there were also expository essays attached that Nancy wrote, uh, Hesse McGraw, who's the director of the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, and I, uh, we each wrote an essay that was also attached. So this uh, NFT had several files that, that came along with it in addition to the visuals. Among other things, this project really shows the power of the artist to bring attention to social issues, which I think is a really crucial aspect of this. We can certainly get caught up in uh, the commerce of everything, but this is really an excellent platform for artists to use in, in many different ways. And I do believe that many of the issues that were raised by Nancy and other artists you know, back, way back in April, um, of this year have increased the understanding that many of these concerns are um, not being considered as much as they need to be by the tech community. Artists are also leading in the way um, the, uh, it, in how they're creatively bringing attention to issues of, as I mentioned earlier, the environment, but also the exclusion of women, BIPOC artists, and LGBTQ artists. Um, this is something that, of course, we, we alluded to earlier. Um, this project, another one that I was really excited to work on, uh, was the White Male Artist Project. And this is a great example of a durational performance through NFTs that was inspired by the original work of Piero Manzoni, who famously canned and sold artist shit as a conceptual art commentary in 1961. The White Male Artist Project unfolded over the course of a month with the anonymous white male artist dropping digital cans of shit based on the diets of the top grossing male artists um, or artists of all time, which just so happened to all be male, of course, and white men. Um, the project was initially positioned as being uh, presented by an anonymous white male artist, but then partway through the, this durational performance, uh, it was revealed that it was in fact the trans artist Castles. The final cans were sold by Phillips Auction House with the intention of demonstrating the value of Castle's work in the same context as the apocryphal white male artist's work um, as presented previously. So these are just two examples of many projects that artists are using to push boundaries of the technology, um, as well as using the technology to convey not only the art, but their social messages as well. Thank you so much. Yayoi, can you speak a little bit to some of the challenges that are perhaps yet to be overcome with respect to these royalties and artists, artists harnessing the opportunities presented more generally by NFTs? Yeah, of course. We want tech to really be the be all and end all, to be essentially the one stop solution to solve all of the world's problems. But there are, are always roadblocks to be had. So kind of like how smartphones are as smart as the person who uses them, smart contracts are actually not that smart, right? And two very large areas to continue thinking about, and some of this was already alluded to in the first panel, point number one is enforceability issues, right? The substantive terms beyond the automatic resale payments may not be enforceable, even if it's embodied in code, but not readable by a layperson, and they therefore didn't assent. Uh, as well, second area, interoperability issues. There are, I think, finally just now developing protocols for universalized standards and inter-platform agreements, for example, the one that you see on the right. And all of this just points 
to the need to start discussing proposals that could serve as jumping off points for standardizing these areas for discussion. So humbly proposing for you one such potential very simple model contract. Uh, this is available to read in Art Asia Pacific, uh, and it was drafted um, together in collaboration with Ryan Su, who is a Singaporean art lawyer. And of course, Sarah herself has also done some fab work here too, as already evidenced by our discussion today. So with respect to the purchase and sale letter agreement for NFTs that Ryan and I put together and available at Art Asia Pacific, uh, just want to point out that it is just a model and it's also attempting to achieve usability as well for non-lawyers like artists and collectors. And it's really attempting to cover the basics but is also protective of the artist who is creating that original work. But again, I think the complexity is really going to be how these rights and obligations travel together with the NFT as the NFT gets transacted among different purchasers. So I think one of the themes that keeps recurring here is friction points with the technology, as well as friction points with the market and the level of education and understanding. I think we're also seeing some disconnects between the traditional sales structures in the art world and the way that NFTs transact. Sarah, can you speak to this a little bit specifically with respect to participation in this space by auction houses? Absolutely. Um, it is a little bit odd to see the auction houses engaged in, you know, really taking a very public lead in the primary market sales. We've seen the auction houses circling the space to figure out a way to um, get closer to that primary sales market um, with the gallery-like shows and the advisory services. But with NFTs, they really jumped in with two feet. This has created some challenges in terms of confusing the role of primary market player, at least um, which part you know, is traditionally to promote the artist's career and to support that growth in a sustainable way and to help them develop a more meaningful trajectory within, that, um, within their, their artist's career. In fact, um, in the case of one client I worked with, the conflict between the terms of what the artist wanted to attach to the NFT, essentially it was the conceptual guts of the project, and the traditional art um, uh, auction house buyer's terms that the auction house insisted on maintaining resulted in the auction house insisting that the artwork be changed in order to let them proceed with the sale. So when push comes to shove, auction houses really are clear that their duty is to the buyer and not to the creator. That's not to say that there aren't people within the auction houses who are very sympathetic to creators' positions and supportive of artists. But when it comes to the construction of a contract, certainly uh, this can be problematic. And I think it puts the auction houses in a very awkward position. Uh, and ultimately, it might not be in the best interests of those artists who are trying to engage in challenging or subversive projects to, to go through this auction house route. And, and not to pile on to the auction houses, because I think that they have had an incredible uh, journey of, you know, dynamically improving their contracts. And I've seen multiple iterations of all of the houses contracts over the last six months. But there are just some innate weirdnesses here, some things that don't track. Um, and so even thinking about something as simple as the traditional auction house consignment agreement contemplates the consignment of a secondary market work for which the consigner doesn't did not create and does not hold the copyright. And so it's very typical for the auction house to say, hey, consigner, please give us a license to make images in our catalog or market the, work, the sale of the work using images, which is a different issue, whether or not a secondary market consigner is in a position to consent to that. But when the auction house is dealing with the creator themselves, that may not be, you know, that, that has a different overlay to it because the auction house in its marketing materials is really creating effectively deriv derivative works that embed images of someone else's creative property. And that is even more complicated when there is a physical companion or component to the NFT work. So on the screen is a work um, by Ocean World, who's an amazing 24-year-old artist from Decatur, Georgia. 
Um, the right is the digital component of the NFT, and you can see that's dynamic. But on the left-hand side, you can see that when you purchase this work, you're also receiving a screen with this kind of overlay this with, that has cutouts in it. And so the actual moving image that's a digital image displayed on a screen displays through and interacts with this physical component piece, which is amazing. But it's a physical piece like any other painting that Sotheby's needs to display in a gallery. And they've engaged a photographer and made creative choices here about how to stage this photograph. And so there are some really interesting issues of overlapping intellectual property rights there that the auction houses may not have had to traditionally contend with. And of course, additionally, issues of condition reports, custody and insurance that come up around um, having these, uh, these projects that, that include both. Um, Beyond that, there's also the disconnect between what the auction house is actually offering. Um, is it the token only? Uh, is it the you know, title to the underlying work? What's exactly being transacted here? And what licenses are gonna be transacted as well? Um, what licenses are granted with regard to that underlying work? So let's unpack that in two pieces in turn. Why do either of those things matter, title and license? Right, so the sale of the token versus the token plus the artwork is fundamental, right? Is the, is the purchaser even acquiring possession of the copy of the copyrighted work? And of course, this depends on what the auction house defines as the nature of what's being sold. Um, and if not, it really does seem antithetical to the whole purpose of what the NFTs were meant to do, um, also creating a lot of confusion within the marketplace. I think quantum is a really interesting example of that. And again, maybe we'll hear from Kevin in the Q&A. But it, so again, this was the May 2021 digitally native sale. So one of the earlier you know, mainstream auction house sales in the space. And this is a work that Kevin created in 2014. So Sotheby's clearly wasn't contemplating you know, what Kevin was doing back in the day. And the terms and conditions that came out for the first sale were relatively and understandably conservative. And most of the auction houses at that time were taking the position and are still taking the position that they are selling you the token only. They are not selling you the digital artwork that's associated with the token. But the sale website for this token, and this is wrapping in another thing that we talked about a little while ago, the sale site for this particular token had a link, a hyperlink, or maybe it just listed the HTTP or the IPFS address where Kevin himself had uploaded this supplemental rights document. And if you zoom in on the rights document, and Kevin mentioned this in his talk, it literally says ownership of the artwork rests with whomever controls the blockchain entry, i.e. the token. So the token per the artist's intent was functioning as a certificate of ownership or title to transfer ownership of this specific copy of the artwork. But there seemed to be a disconnect there between the auction house terms and these supplemental terms. Yeah, I mean, this becomes really important as we look at the health and like creating healthy NFTs that can actually go into the future and have some life beyond just that initial sale. What we're talking about is really needing to pay attention to things like the right to loan, um, you know, with for museum shows or other uh, public displays of the work, and other um, rights that transfer with that purchase. Um, and this is, of course, uh, it's problematic that there's a total lack of uniformity in the marketplace right now. Um, and when you have different parties that are working at cross purposes or who have different goals involved in um, establishing those business practices, it makes it even more complex to bring those things together. This is such an important point to unpack. So just to make sure we're all at the same starting point here, because I know there are you know, very esteemed copyright attorney colleagues in the audience, but I know we also have participants from other segments of the industry. So let's note that going back to the introduction to this panel about how some aspects of the Copyright Act may not track for digital works, I think a really key example of that is section 109. So the public display right under 109C, the bottom bullet point here, maybe it doesn't work so well to allow the purchaser of a digital work to display it to viewers who are present at the place where it's located. Because what if that place is actually many nodes where fragments of the data are stored across a decentralized network? 
Similarly, the 2013 Redigi case is generally understood to stand for the proposition that there is no section 109A first sale right for digital works because media files are effectively fungible. And we have yet to see whether that precedent will be reconsidered in light of the non-fungibility that NFTs purport to imbue specific copies of these files with via SHA-256 hash identification or otherwise. And of course, where a right is not covered by default by this statutory language, the parties need to fill in the gap through a license. Right, so this is another reason to attach specific terms uh, to the copyrighted work. But of course, we have to be careful about that articulation. We're seeing a really wide array of different kinds of licenses of what would otherwise be creators exclusive, exclusive rights under the Copyright Act with respect to the visual works and other creative works that are referenced by the NFTs um, that are being sold. And in some cases, the licenses mirror the rights of the purchaser of a physical work um, that, that, you know, a phys uh, that a purchaser of a physical work would get um, by statutory default. But in other cases, they exceed those rights and actually come much closer to a, an assignment of copyright, which is really interesting. One example is the Board Ape Yacht Club um, terms, which have, this has created some confusion lately, which again, super fascinating for lawyers who are in this space, of course. Um, there's been some confusion around the scope of what commercial exploitation is allowed. So in this case, this is beyond just um, actually receiving the, the artwork uh, in the purchase. There's, there are commercial rights that also transfer. Um, so there's been some question as to how far those commercial rights extend. What can you use your ape for? Can you put it on packaging? Can you, um, you know, can you use um, the logo of the board Ape Yacht Club? The answer is no, at least according to them. Um, but you know, these things are going to have to be worked out over time. And uh, again, because there's not really any standard being applied right now, these uh, articulations can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, another example is the Crypto Kitties. There's a, you know, they, they also have some commercial rights associated with them. I believe that there's a $100,000 profit limit uh, that attaches to the commercial exploitation. And then another example here is the junkyard dogs. Pretty broad right here, uh, but restricts use for things like hate speech or porn. So you've got, you know, completely different buckets of, of rights that are being transferred and restrictions that are being placed uh, on those uses. Then, of course, there's also the platform model, um, which needs to focus on the rights of the creator, really, because that's, you know, who's coming to this site often is the creator. Um, and then being less permissive in terms of what's transferred to the collectors. As the platform, they, they need to really be very careful about what they're having uh, creators represent and making sure that hopefully collectors are clear on what they're purchasing in that process. So the average license is pretty explicit about personal use. And, and in a way that approximates uh, first sale type rights and public display. Um, but there really isn't, again, a particularly reliable standard. Uh, here we've got pictured, uh, I believe, the website from Foundation, which tends to be one of the broader um, uh, explanations of rights um, that, are, that are found there. But again, really no standardization um, across the board. And this is something that we're going to have to really pay attention to as we move forward. And then just on the auction house side, while the auction house might be getting a narrower promotional license and that may be more negotiable as a customized matter of business operations, um, they are receiving, uh, sorry, they're giving purchasers generally a narrower license or not being nearly as express about that grant as some of the platforms. So there's give and take and there's no perfect way to offer NFTs in the marketplace right now, nor is a purchaser getting absolute certainty from either of these types of sale venues. But there is this divergence between how dedicated NFT platforms and auction houses seem to be handling both license grants in and license grants out. Yeah, and so to sort of scale back a little bit and think about the collector or user experience with this incredible panoply of options, it's really not that surprising that collectors don't usually or sometimes do not understand what they are buying and what rights 
they might have, right? So we were talking about the use rights that has been consistent of a point to discuss in both panels uh, throughout today's conversation. There are also issues of insurability and valuation as well. And again, this is difficult because for both artists and collectors, right? Many of the digital assets being offered are just digital assets easily screenshotted or right clicked with infinite opportunity for copying. And then once a collector has copied this uh, digital underlying asset, it's easy for them to use whether pursuant to license terms or otherwise, right? And so again, harder to control with a lack of understanding and proliferation of varying license terms. And of course, the stakes are becoming higher because there is monetization to be had. For example, rights holders like Larva Labs who created CryptoPunks are actively seeking to monetize their copyright through entertainment agency, United Talent Agency. So they recently signed on to this deal. And so presumably UTA will now license derivative works, presumably on things like album covers, TV cartoons, movies, and what have you. And this monetization train keeps going as long as the franchise has staying power. Yeah, Yoey, thinking about these unanswered questions and market confusion issues, I want to note that, you know, we're talking a lot today about living young artists, emerging artists. You work with an incredible estate and an incredible established artist. Can you give us some insight as to how you and your clients or principals might be thinking about NFT in terms of these intellectual property pros and cons or in terms of legacy uses? Yeah, thanks for that. And I love it how recently to compare and distinguish between um, NFT artists, I now often have to say that I work with legacy artists. And again, these legacy artists that I have the honor of working with is the Chris Burden Estate and the Nancy Rubens Studio. And I have had a fair amount of robust debate, both with Nancy as well as my team at the studio and estate as to how we should think about these NFTs and what we should potentially be doing both as an estate and as a living artist studio. So for living artists, there's obviously nothing wrong with active experimentation. If a non-digital native artist wants to experiment, for example, like similar to a painter who also does social sculpture or a dancer who also uses text, so a sculptor who might want to then NFT their work, that's fabulous and that's really wonderful. But that doesn't mean that all non-digital native artists need to be jumping on the NFT bang way. That actually feels a little bit speculative. So in a highly biased and informal Instagram survey that had only about 200 impressions about the title of this symposium, about whether NFTs are the future or a fad, 47% in this highly biased survey said here to stay, 53% said please let it be a fad. From my perspective, I do think NFTs as a format is here to stay, but I do want to come back to the fact that I think NFTs have not yet been contextualized within the art historical perspective. It remains to be seen how this art historical contextualization from new media art, digital art, internet art, post-internet art to NFT art how those dots are connected. And of course, some of this is really happening real time and art history will likely trail afterwards. So now for an estate with intellectual property assets, what to do? From a legal perspective, as long as you do in fact own the IP rights to the underlying assets, it's actually easy to use the IP and translate it into an NFT if you want from a legal perspective. But from a artist legacy and strategic perspective, the questions that I like to ask is really for what purpose are we attempting to NFT this object or this underlying asset? And again, thinking about artist intent, I think is crucial here for those of you who work with estates. 
Would the artist have liked to have experimented with a new medium? Or would they have in fact disclaimed this transference of media, this use of variable media? And from a practical perspective, of course, making the caption accurate, I think is always the way to go. There have been some recent complicated uh, examples of estates and legacy artists working with the NFT format. On the left is the example from the Warhol Foundation. Uh, this is actually something that Megan and I covered in a uh, panel with Rhizome earlier this summer. So I'm, I don't really wanna go into it too much, but Warhol's NFTs were sold through Christie's this summer. And there was some question as to what the NFT should have been. Should the NFT have been the very low res original image created by Warhol using a specific technological uh, program that is now obsolete versus the high res TIFF images that were minted by the foundation. So that's an example on Warhol. And the example on the right is more recent from Basquia. Uh, there was recently an NFT of the 1986 drawing, Free Comb with Pagoda, which was recently withdrawn from sale on OpenSea after the state pulled it for copyright reasons. Thank you so much. Switching gears a little bit again, I wanted to make sure that we cover some copyright issues arising in the collaboration context, which is becoming so frequent in the NFT space. We may have a visual artist who creates a work on paper and then finds an animator to adapt that into a moving clip and a musician who adds a sound element. And those three things are combined and tokenized and sold as a package or access to or ownership of a particular copy is sold as a package through transfer of the token. What are some of the challenges or practice points around that, Sarah? All right, so we'll start with some of the technical stuff and then we can get into the project that's, um, that's pictured here. I, I think it's important to pay attention to um, what's going on between the parties, right? So rather than hoping that everyone is on the same page around rights, it's always good to have an articulate uh, uh, expression of exactly what's going on, um, like an agreement. Uh, and in most cases, this would be a work made for hire um, with some backup uh, assignment clause since the enumerated categories of what, what is a work for hire um, within the copyright law is pretty narrow. Um, so it would be either work for hire or are we talking about a joint authorship, which would indicate a true intention at the time of creation for con uh, the contributions to be merged. So really looking at the, the intentions of the people who are working together is a really important practice point, I think, to, to keep in mind and pay attention to. Agreed. And I think it's important to point out as well that among those objectives or intentions can be various things that are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but can be addressed separately. So an artist or a collaborator may wish to be credited they may wish to have a revenue share. Those things are not necessarily synonymous with being recognized as a co-author for copyright purposes. And there are ways to ensure credit through contractual agreements or to ensure revenue share through minting multiple you know, um, wallets into a token. So some of these things can be addressed independently of each other. Yeah, I think that this once again raises the, the, the question and the issue of whether copyright in its current st uh, format really applies appropriately to what's happening in the digital context. Um, it does, however, raise again and highlight more brightly the same issues that have been bubbling up for a long time um, around the role of artisans and other creative workers who support the output of artists creating monumental and often prolific artworks. Um, especially when these artworks sell for incredible sums based on the brand of the artist with absolutely no credit to the underlying uh, people who have actually been executing and, and, and uh, creating the work. Well, creating physically the work, I suppose. Um, in many cases, these artisans are creatively solving problems that the artist hasn't even considered in executing that artist's concept or vision. So this is um, where I, I love to refer to Peter Wu's uh, Epoch Gallery project. Um, and this was a project I got to work on um, a few months ago. 
Um, this is a really interesting um, approach. What he does here, uh, Peter creates a VR environment uh, into which he builds other artists' works. And for this, we developed a collaboration agreement between Peter and the included artists. So we have that relationship um, on one side. And this collaboration is really important to the nature of the work. Um, and it's highlighted again in the collector agreement. So on the other side of the transaction. And in this case, Peter went to a great deal of effort to build a smart contract that allows for multiple royalty distributions to all of the participating artists so that every transaction um, doesn't just benefit the, the artist on the project, Peter, um, but it benefits all of the underlying artists as well. Peter owns the overall exhibition, um, and that is what is NFT'd and sold, but the artists share in the proceeds um, of the primary and secondary market sales. Again, highlighting this issue that copyright ownership might not be the ultimate question, but questions around um, sharing in proceeds and um, getting credit for work may be ultimately what's more important to creators. I know we're coming up against time, but I just wanted to add a little bit also to the fact that we also need to remember that currently right now, most of these NFTs are bought and sold on the platform, right? So the platform will always have standard adhesion terms and conditions, and then creators actually are generally required to indemnify these platforms. So practical tip is always knowing who you or your client are getting in bed with what each of the members of the potential collaborative are contributing to the finalized artwork and what their expectations are. Um, and of course, having or attempting to have some sort of agreement amongst the collaborative members is key because of course that liability will unfortunately flow backwards. I wanna thank you all. I am gonna jump in uh, here because we have a, just a few minutes left and we do have a bunch of questions. Um, I am gonna be very rude and start out with my own question, which is I am very interested in the possibility of a retail royalty. And I'm wondering if, um, if there's a way that NFTs can um, solve some of the legislative problems that we've had with retail royalties. Uh, and if, the, if a built-in resale royalty is enforceable, uh, you know, is it enforceable and, and, and uh, how could we make that work potentially? That's a huge question and I don't wanna take up all the time, but. I just would like to point out one challenge with the resale royalties issues, um, especially when it comes to the NFTs, which is that in traditional resale royalty structures, the resale royalty is based on the profit that's earned in future sales. And right now, the way that the resale royalties work is that it's applied to the entire gross resale amount. So. You know, I think we're going to have to start looking to, to see if there's a way to um, adjust that, <laughs> you know, because ultimately, if you have a resale royalty for every single transaction that's paid out on the gross, what you may be doing is slowing down the market transactions that people are interested in engaging in. So we want to sort of strike a balance between supporting the artist and creator and making sure that they're benefiting from future um, increases in value, but at the same time, supporting the collectors and those people who are engaging in the transactions as well and supporting the overall marketplace uh, ecology. If I can add to that also, I think one of, I think, the potentially best optimistic ways to think about NFTs and digital art transactions is in fact this opportunity for artists who create work and put it out there into the world. We all love working in the art world because we love working with artists. Artists are really the lifeblood of our ecosystem. And we want them to be able to both profit from the primary sale, but also from the secondary sale as well. And so I think it is uh, there is an opportunity to actualize that intent. But I think from a practical perspective, we're long ways away, partially based on the reasons that Sarah mentioned, but also because there is still very much an interoperability issue amongst these various platforms. And many more platforms are popping up every single day as well. Uh, so I wanna go to some of the questions we have. I think we might go a couple minutes over, but um, one question is, in case the code underlying the smart contract has a bug or is hacked, is that 
a breach of one party to another, um, what recourse is available to an artist? Um, well, it could be a breach. Um, and so that's one of the things that in the contracts that I'm putting together for the artists, you know, we specifically call out not only um, the, the extent of the responsibility that the artist can take, but as well, what put some potential remedies would be. So right now we're sort of stuck with um, uh, some fairly um, primitive ways of making sure that the, the purchaser is um, gonna maintain the assets that they're buying. So maybe emailing directly the file or allowing them to download the file separately um, is one way to provide some protection but then also calling out the potential remedy. So, and this, this goes back to what we were talking about in terms of what kinds of rights are transferring with the NFT. Like one of the things to think about is what happens if there is a breakage of the link or something else goes wrong in the process. Can the um, owner of the NFT, can it be reminted? Um, is there some way to contact the artist to have a replacement made? You know, so you have to think through a lot of those things in terms of making that NFT good in the long term. We definitely need to think about what could go wrong and how do we fix it down the road. So maintenance and conservation, much like we see in other digital media. And I'll just chime in to say that again, you know, this is not really a copyright specific question, but in thinking about the marketplace for visual art and that divergence that we spoke about earlier, both in terms of license terms and title issues, we are also seeing auction houses much more explicitly address a disclaimer of any liability when a purchaser acquires an NFT. The purchaser is not obtaining any assurance from an auction house that they will have any kind of continued access to the asset that's associated with the NFT or that the link will remain functional or that the file or the content will not degrade. Um, so that's being much more expressly addressed. I will say that on the dedicated NFT platforms, you're generally not receiving an assurance that you will have continued access or that you will get a new copy. So as Sarah mentioned, this is something that some artists are very proactively including supplemental terms to the effect of we are part of a community. There's a creative economy that you're supporting and I wanna, I have an obligation, a moral obligation to you and I will participate in conservation if and as needed. And that's really pretty analogous to what we see in the traditional art world as well. Um, so we, here's another question, yeah. We have Kevin here with us. And so I actually wanted to take the opportunity to pick his brain too. Um, thanks so much, Kevin, for sort of doing your whirlwind history of NFTs and your involvement. And I, I guess sort of a softball question for you. I'm just curious, how do you feel now in 2021, heading into 2021, 2022, everyone seems to be thinking about NFTs and digital art, and it's becoming more and more of a common parlance amongst artists in the art world. And, and how does it feel for you? Uh, because in some ways you've already sort of been there and done that, you started that many, many years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, yeah, that's really true. The, um, you know, I, you know I, knew, I knew the idea when I proposed it was a big idea, uh, and it was frustrating to have it not be widely recognized, and it now it is widely recognized. Um, so, and to a certain extent, I'm not surprised about the the extent of people's imaginations about it. Um, but I didn't really know how it was how it would feel when it is like this worldwide phenomenon. So that is pretty um, pretty incredible. Um, and then also, it's interesting, you know, because I, you know, my entree was through Bitcoin a long time ago, and, and in that that world. Uh, in, in 2012, even you know, 2011, even before I was there, 2013, you know, people were spinning through all of these ideas. You know, so at an idea level, um, so much territory was kind of mapped out, um, and so now so much more things are now happening. You know, are more um, you know in, in, in actual practice, but there is still this kind of chronic um, coming soonism. Um, that's 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 always happening. So so I mean, which I think is a good thing. I'm not saying that's bad, but but you know, there's still so much more to come, and it's all kind of you know happening, and you know, it's, all these things will kind of come in. And but but the idea space, in my mind, as a kind of veteran, is like, yeah, it's it's been largely mapped out. Um, but again, seeing these things in practice is different, and it's fun, and and so many people are involved, and you know, the kind of community building part of it is all really great. 
I, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, I have so many more questions and we have a lot of long questions in the chat and I'm sorry that we didn't get to so many of your questions. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been a crazy, crazy day of involvement on both the, the audience side, the panelist side and a great discussion. Um, so hopefully some of our speakers can address uh, some of the questions uh, offline. Uh, I think uh, you can probably find out how to reach all of our speakers through their bios. So uh, if you have a very specific question, I'm sure um, they'd be happy to answer it. Uh, it's hard to answer the questions that are sort of uh, large and, and uh, addressing the entire universe though. Um, so thank you so much to uh, our attendees and more thank you so much to our panelists who have made the day fabulous. Uh, Sarah, Yoyoi, Kevin, Megan, thank you for a wonderful panel representing the arts industry. Uh, we learned so much uh, and uh, it's such an important and interesting area and development of this, of this specialty. So I wanna thank everyone who participated today uh, I, uh, I, I was joking at the beginning when I said we'll do part two some other time, but now I'm thinking maybe we'll have to, even if we just continue this discussion alone, it could be a whole symposium. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great afternoon uh, and take care. Or, yeah, I guess it's still afternoon for you, Sarah, barely. Not yet. Or still, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you.